Gospel host G. Gordon Liddy upon receiving the Freedom of Speech Award. I want you to know that I also recognize that in giving me this award, you are not in any way signaling that you necessarily agree with my opinions. What you are indicating is that you, unlike apparently an awful lot of people, understand freedom of speech. Sound like a high school and Sunday night, Representative Richard Gephardt. I realize that you may be skeptical of what I'm going to say today. After all, I'm one of those proudly progressive Democrats, a member of that most revered institution, the United States Congress, an ally of talk radio's all-time favored politician, President Bill Clinton. So you see how I earned my place on the hit parade of my fellow Missourian Rush Limbaugh. I can assure you it's not because of any regional bias. I came here today all too aware of the all too common disinformation on much of talk radio. Saturday night, G. Gordon Liddy at 8 Eastern and Pacific and House Democrat Richard Gephardt, Sunday night at 6 p.m. Eastern. Next, a hearing on the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, conducted by the House District of Columbia Subcommittee. In May, Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House was permanently closed off to cars and trucks. Pedestrians can still walk by the executive mansion, and future plans call for an expanded park there. Chairing the committee, Republican Thomas Davis of Virginia, whose district is just outside Washington, D.C. This hearing runs two and a half hours. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our informational hearing on the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. Pennsylvania Avenue is a major arterial road for the District of Columbia. It was part of the L'Enfant Plan for the development of Washington, D.C. Pennsylvania Avenue connects the Capitol to the White House and has been called America's Main Street. Any closing of this historic street has enormous symbolic impact, whether the closure is temporary or permanent. On May 19, 1995, Secretary of the Treasury Robert E. Rubin signed an order prohibiting vehicular traffic on Pennsylvania Avenue and on certain other streets adjacent to the White House. The Secretary delegated to the rec Director of the United States Secret Service all necessary authority to carry out such street closings. The need for presidential security and for temporary arrangements to affect that security is not questioned. Rather, this hearing will inquire into the authority to affect permanent changes to city streets in the District of Columbia and to assess the consequences of the actions taken with regarding Pennsylvania Avenue. It's essential for Congress to be certain that proper procedures were followed. An important distinct distinction must be drawn between temporary and permanent changes to city streets. The law provides that both the District of Columbia government and Congress have a key role to play in any street closings. Commuters and other motorists entering the district have a vital stake in the orderly flow of traffic. The impact of any change to a major city street such as Pennsylvania Avenue must be carefully evaluated with this in mind. There are also fiscal issues for Congress to review. The changes made will affect many more streets than just those referred to in the Treasury order. Revenues from parking meters, loading zones, and vending spaces for adjacent streets must be analyzed as to any adverse impact on the city. The subcommittee has initiated correspondence with the city and the Treasury Department on this issue. Those letters and correspondence will be put into the record of this hearing. Many city officials are here to testify today. The subcommittee and Treasury Department mutually concluded that testimony, in addition to previously available written remarks, would not move us significantly forward today. However, I intend to continue the correspondence with Secretary Rubin, and at an appropriate time this summer, the subcommittee will conduct another hearing to address the long-term situation regarding Pennsylvania Avenue. It is vital that information on this issue be put into the record in order for this subcommittee to determine if further action is warranted. I would yield now to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mrs. Norton, for an opening statement. Ms. Norton. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank Chairman Davis for his quick response to my request for this hearing. The residences, the residents, businesses, and officials of the District of Columbia deserve their day in court. 
We need to know the effect of the critical decision to close Pennsylvania Avenue, a major thoroughfare of this city, uh, on those who have personally to live with it. I do not intend day in court to imply a challenge to the decision to take steps to protect the President and the White House complex. Following the Oklahoma City tragedy, most residents and commuters have accepted the need for further action. What we do not accept are any further unilateral steps without thorough consultation and agreement. Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt and L.J. Baron, Director of the Secret Service, have personally assured me that full collaboration with district officials, members of Congress, and others will now take place. With such cooperation, we can perhaps mitigate further damage to the district while maintaining strong security for the President. We must accept the present closure, but I do not accept the notion that historic Pennsylvania Avenue must be closed forever. The case simply has not been made for a permanent closing. Will advances in technology, for example, make such heavy-handed garrison state security measures unnecessary in the future. The burden is on the Secret Service and others who are responsible for the closure. That burden has not yet been met. My major concern now is to mitigate the harmful effect of the present closing on residents, businesses, commuters, tourists, and the city itself. In closing down a major artery of this city, the federal government has affected the lifeblood of our fragile economy. We have few enough residents and businesses in the city without making life harder for those hardy enough to remain. Every action we take must be done not only for the convenience of the government, but also the convenience of the taxpayers. The president must be protected. So must the average resident. The closing could not have occurred at a worse time. The district does not have sufficient funds to keep its government going. Last night's action blocking a waiver of matching funds may mean a loss of $82 million to repair our streets. Residents and businesses are holding on for dear life. Now, with the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, what is to happen to those who have offices and businesses that have been made more inaccessible? What is the effect on property values? What effect does this have on the dwindling treasury of the District of Columbia? How are residents who live in the surrounding community affected? What has been the impact on traffic? In short, what has been the damage and what can be done about it? Respect for D.C. residents is also shown by respecting our local government, our local officials, and our local processes. We are told that security requirements made respect for the normal procedures impossible. That cannot be said of any further actions that may be taken. I will not support any further action in the affected area that does not have full public participation and support. This includes tearing up Pennsylvania Avenue to construct a mall, disturbing Lafayette Park, or in any way changing the area in front or behind the White House. I do not support a nationwide competition to prepare for any further changes. There will be time to determine whether these are appropriate steps. There is too little information available to make any further precipitous changes. This hearing begins the federal government's attempt to begin to get that kind of information. Hopefully this hearing will also result in the establishment of a collegial process that will bring satisfactory results all can all concern can support. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Norton, thank you very much. Let me recognize uh, the uh, chairman of our full committee, who's been a friend of the District of Columbia, uh, Mr. Uh, Klinger, and ask if you'd like to make any comment. Uh, no, I'll say that, Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, commend you, Ms. Norton, for holding this hearing. I think it's, uh, it's time that we do get a full explication of the need uh, for what has happened 
and also I'm interested in finding out what the implications have been for the city thus far, what sort of an impact it's had, what, what are the long-term uh, implications of the closing and how long and so forth. I think Ms. Norton has raised a number of the critical questions that we hope will begin to get some uh, information about in this, in this hearing. So I again commend you both for holding the hearing. Thank you. And let me ask the ranking uh, uh, the majority uh, member of this committee, Mr. McHugh, if he has any uh, comments he'd like to make at this time. Gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like uh, the full committee chairman, I don't have a prepared statement, but I certainly want to add my words of appreciation to you for uh, providing the continued leadership on, on not just this, but so many matters uh, affecting this very important place in our nation. Uh, I commend Mrs. Norton as well for her continuing concerns uh, uh, in relation to the very special uh, place in this country that she has the honor of representing. Uh, this is, as uh, Chairman Klinger just noted, a very important uh, situation, one that affects uh, not just the residents of the District of Columbia, although certainly it does affect them in very real and palpable ways, but uh, virtually every American citizen. And I think it is very, very important that we begun to begin to uh, take a very careful look at this process and ensure that whatever may happen in the future is in the best interest of uh, every concerned party. Lastly, let me uh, pay uh, my words of welcome to the distinguished panel members who have uh, come here today to share their insights and perspectives uh, with us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McHugh. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce and welcome our distinguished witnesses. I'm advised that the uh, District Council Chairman Dave Clark, who is listed on our first panel, is en route from a hearing that he's been chairing about the ARENA project. And I'll certainly entertain Chairman Clark's testimony up upon his arrival. Our two other representatives of the District uh, Government are present, Mr. Michael Rogers, the City Administrator, and Councilman Frank Smith, Jr., uh, who chairs the relevant Council Committee. Uh, Mr. Rogers will testify as a representative uh, of the uh, Barry administration, and he will be accompanied by Mr. Larry King, Director of Public Works for the District of Columbia. Gentlemen, as you know, it's the policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn in before they may testify. Would you please rise with me and raise your right hand? Do you uh, solemnly swear that the uh, testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. You may be seated. The subcommittee will carefully review any written statements you care to submit, and I respectfully ask that oral testimony be limited to five minutes each. At this time, I'm going to ask Mr. Rogers for his statement, followed by Councilman Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Ms. Norton, Mr. McHugh, I'm Michael Rogers, City Administrator of the District of Columbia. Thank you for inviting me to address you regarding the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue and the impact of this closure on the District of Columbia, its residents, and its business community. For your information and to give you a frame of reference for these recent events, I would like to recap the activities of the past few months. In early April 1995, the District of Columbia Department of Public Works and the Metropolitan Police Department became aware that the Department of the Treasury was considering a closure of portions of Pennsylvania Avenue and E Streets. However, this initial contact, these initial contacts were in the form of consultations. The district initially advised against uh, the closures. However, after the Oklahoma City bombing, we were informed that the closures would occur. When it became clear that the closures were to be made, DPW and MPD took the following immediate steps. First, parking was restricted on certain streets surrounding the closure. Uh, including 8th Street, I Street, 15th Street, and 17th Street. Numerous intersections were identified which would require special management as a result of the closure, and MPD took control of these intersections to assist in traffic management. Secondly, in response to concerns expressed by the district and the Washington Metropolitan Trans Transportation Authority, Madison Place Northwest from H to Pennsylvania Avenue remained open in the southbound direction for metro buses only. Pennsylvania Avenue from Madison Place to 15th Street was similarly uh, open in the eastbound direction for metro buses only. Third, a long-term traffic management plan was devised which has been implemented as of this week. <coughs> Beginning Monday, June 26, 1995, the following changes were made. 
designation of H Street Northwest from New York Avenue to Pennsylvania Avenue as one-way eastbound. The street was uh, previously, of course, uh, two-way. <coughs> designation of I Street Northwest from uh, New York Avenue to Pennsylvania Avenue as one-way westbound. The street was previously one-way eastbound. Designation of 15th Street Northwest from New York Avenue to K Street as one-way northbound. The street was previously two-way. Mr. Chairman and members, as you know, the district has incurred a substantial cost as a result of the closings. For example, the cost incurred by the Department of Public Works for conversion of the streets in the vicinity of the closure has been budgeted at approximately $165,000. A special account has been established by the Federal Highway Administration to fully fund this effort. With regard to the Metropolitan Police Department, Officers have been operating traffic posts around the White House since May 22nd. These duties are being performed by off-duty police officers who are working from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. during weekdays. The detail is composed of a maximum of 23 traffic posts, three traffic enforcement scooter officers, three sergeants for supervision, and one lieutenant to direct uh, the operation. However, since this is a voluntary detail, not all posts are always filled. According to an agreement between MPD and the Department of the Treasury, the department will be reimbursed at a rate of $33.29 uh, per hour. And we have the listing of uh, the number of officers and the hours uh, and the reimbursements and the dates. For these dates, the costs total about $134,000. With the new traffic patterns, the number of traffic posts has dropped uh, to 18, and MPD anticipates that the detail will be necessary through July 14th. With regard to parking meter revenue, we estimate that to date about $62,000 has been lost as a result of the initial costs, uh, initial actions taken following the closures. It should be noted that after a few days, most of the parking restrictions were relaxed and the loss of revenue decreased greatly. The Washington Metropolitan Transportation Authority estimates that the change in bus routes, uh, increase in, the drive, in driver time, increase in supervision, and notification of changes to the public has cost about $45,000. In addition, the Office of Mass Transit at DPW incurred $23,000 in costs in relocating bus shelters to new locations. Mr. Chairman, it is uh, the opinion of the District of Columbia that clearly any cost or loss the closures from the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue East and East Street should be reimbursed by the federal government. To date, the federal government has, been, has reimbursed the district appropriately. As a part of the long-term evaluation of the closures, economic impacts will be identified, including the loss of business uh, to enterprises in the area, of the closure and the impacts of tourism. This study will require some additional time for uh, completion. In addition, the responsibility for emergency response and security on uh, the 1600 block of Pennsylvania Avenue must be determined. It is our opinion that MPD continues to have jurisdiction over the street. Under previous arrangement, the park police had jurisdiction over Lafayette Park, the sidewalk near Lafayette Park, and the sidewalk next to the White House fence. While MPD had formal jurisdiction over the street, it allowed the park service, uh, the park police, to do the day-to-day -day enforcement on the street. MPD took over when there was demonstrations on the street uh, segment. We recommend that if and when any architectural changes are made to the area, further discussions are needed between MPD, park police, the Secret Service, the FBI, etc. Uh, in closing, and I'll wrap up quickly, uh, we in the district are also concerned about the long-term and proposed architectural changes for the Pennsylvania Avenue and East Street area. If the federal government decides to make the closure permanent, it should request a formal closing. This process, when completed, will result in, the free, in freeing the district of any maintenance uh, responsibility for the streets. If the architectural changes are expected prior to the formal closures, and change of jurisdiction. The District of Columbia would expect to participate in the evaluations of such study, studies. I appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, before you and after hearing uh, uh, Councilmember Smith, uh, Mr. King and I would uh, 
answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, Councilman Smith, uh, Frank, it's good to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Davis, and to my own Congresswoman, Mrs. Norton, and Mr. McHugh, and other members of the Congress, I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of the Council and, and our government. As you already indicated, Chairman Clark is holding a hearing on uh, the arena tax this morning. He is uh, hopefully wrapping that up soon enough to get here today, and when he does, uh, but he did ask me to convey to you his reason for being late. It is a pleasure to testify today <clears throat> on the recent temporary restriction of vehicular traffic access on Pennsylvania Avenue and nearby streets, which, as I will explain shortly, is the preferred characterization of this action on the part of the Treasury Department. In addition to our responsibility in the area of housing planning and zoning, the, the Council Committee on Housing and Urban Affairs, the committee which I chair, is responsible for alley, for street and alley closing legislation that comes before the Council. On May 26, less than a week after the Treasury Department's restrictions, our committee held a roundtable. On June 22, the committee marked up its report and a proposed resolution. The resolution was introduced originally by myself and by Chairman Clark, and we expect that it will become before the full Council on July 11 for markup at, that, at our next session. The committee report and <coughs> proposed resolution, which is attached to my testimony, uh, are attached to my testimony. Let me say at the outset uh, that the Council, like all good pe people of goodwill, is deeply concerned about the President's security and would not want any, in any way to impede the appropriate efforts within the law to improve security for the President of the United States. I do, however, want to address some issues deserving of our further attention. Uh, through the public hearing, we wanted to explore the implications of uh, this restriction, not only on costs for the city and revenues foregone, about which you will be hearing further from other people in the city, but on other issues as well. We reviewed the restrictions as it related to future planning, local businesses, and the preservation of the integrity of what I call the President's plan uh, for Washington, namely the early plans generated and approved by Congress of the United States under the sponsorship of President George Washington. We put together evidence about the jurisdiction, and I don't intend to dwell on all of the points uh, about that, except I want to summarize a few of them. A major issue is that is the jurisdiction of the various streets affected by the Treasury Department's closure. Closure. It is the view of the committee, based on the law and evidence submitted at the hearing and in the report, that the district uh, has jurisdiction, as distinguished from ownership, over much of the area uh, entailed by the Treasury Department's vehicular restriction. By reference to the report, you will find uh, uh, that the city's jurisdiction rests on two pillars. The first of these pillars has to do with the city's chart of 1802 and whether Pennsylvania Avenue between 15th Street and 17th Street Northwest, along the uh, and along with other presently restricted streets, existed or were planned in 1802 and were therefore automatically uh, covered by the Charter. The original planned public streets and alleys of the City of Washington were cited in the congressionally granted Charter of 1802 as being under the jurisdiction, as distinguished from the ownership, of the local government. While the Charter was amended subsequently and additional streets and alley closing legislation was enacted, uh, this fundamental jurisdiction was never changed. The second pillar has to do with evidence of the existence of these streets and their maintenance by the district or of changed jurisdiction under applicable law. While there is some uncertainty about the planning of Pennsylvania Avenue before 1820, there is evidence of its existence and its maintenance by local government from early 1820s, and you can see my attached testimony, the testimony from Mr. Hawkins. Uh, in this century, the Street Readjustment Act of 1932 was enacted by Congress to provide a way to formalize the transfer of streets uh, not already covered by the 1802 Act. Finally, the Street and Alley Closing Acquisitions uh, uh, Procedures Act of 1982 was enacted by the City Council, which is currently the law with which we deal now. These early actions and subsequent uh, legislative acts all give the District of Columbia the jurisdictional authority over these streets and alleys uh, not otherwise retained by the federal government or which are under completely private ownership without easements uh, for the district government's use. Uh, the second issue has to do with the, prop with the proper characteri properly characterizing the Treasury Department's action. It is our view that the Treasury Department has the authority to effect certain temporary traffic restrictions under provisions cited in its Treasury uh, Order 170-09, but that the permanent complete street closing remains, at least under current law, within the purview of the district government. The Council Committees on Housing and Urban Affairs decided to characterize the Treasury's action as, quote, a temporary restriction of vehicular access rather than a street closing. 
Pedestrian access will be allowed. Buses will turn onto the avenue from Madison Place, and if Pennsylvania Avenue is left largely open, perhaps at least buses will be allowed in the future. If the streets were closed permanently and completely to both pedestrian and vehicular traffic, and if those streets were to qualify as falling under the district's jurisdictions, it is our contention that such closings would be subject to the district's Street and Alley Closing and Acquisitions Procedures Act of 1982. I see my light has come on here, so I better start to summarize. Uh, it is the uh, view. Mike, let me just say the whole statement's in the record. So oh, to the, the extent whole you don't read it, we're reading the whole statement up here, so questions will be based on your The whole statement. statement is in the record. Let me just say, in view of these conclusions about the jurisdiction, the council is concerned not only about the district's immediate problem related to this restriction, but also about whether there will be any breaks on the federal government's actions in the future regarding possible other restrictions or other jurisdictional issues uh, having to do with the district streets. In general, it does not seem to me to be good public policy to skirt on the edge of the law or to allow such latitude of interpretation that, abs with, that with absolute discretion, where absolute discretion can be exercised without clear standards and clear scrutiny. I won't go into the issues of costs and things like that. You've heard those from the chairman, uh, from the, uh, the uh, our public works, uh, from our Deputy Mayor, and you will hear more about the uh, public from the Public Works Department. Uh, and I'll just summarize by saying that uh, my, you do have my written statement, and uh, I stand ready to answer any questions that you might have regarding these matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let, let me just start the uh, questioning, uh, and I'll start with you, uh, uh, Councilman Smith. The, the district law that would provide a, a process for closing st streets and so on, if if the Secret Service and the White House wanted to follow, and the Treasury Department wanted to follow that. Could you explain to me what those procedures would be? And secondly, what concessions, if any, are normally requested or received uh, from those who applied to close a local street or alley? I mean, what would be the general process if they wanted to call this a street closing? What would be involved in the costs and stuff in your judgment? Okay, the way our process works, uh, it begins with the abutting property owners making an application to our, uh, to the uh, survey of the District of Columbia, Mr. Lance's office. Uh, and in this case, the abutting uh, property owners uh, would be considered the U.S. government. And so they would uh, make a request, and then the uh, surveyor's office would do, do his due diligence, so to speak, and then would uh, forward uh, his recommendation to the mayor of the District of Columbia. The mayor of the District of Columbia would forward a resolution uh, recommending the street and alley closing to the Council of the District of Columbia. It would be referred to the committee which I chair. We would hold a public hearing. Uh, vote the matter out, and uh, then it would come before the full council. Go back to the mayor for signing, and and it would uh, the the uh, uh, that's how the process works. But you would look at the costs involved, and that would all be factored in at that point. Would Absolutely. Uh, what the uh, what the uh, the surveyor's office the surveyor's office has to do a series of things. Uh, they must consult with the public works department about issues involving trash and uh, access to trash collection and and pickup. They would consult with the fire department about issues related to whether you could still fight the fires around there because you have to leave access to uh, various. And then they would also clear up the title of the budding property owners to make sure that we had the right parties at the table and uh, whatever issues they may have between them, make recommendations on those issues. So they would do their, and they would also check, by the way, with the various utilities involved uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, for example, water and sewer didn't, could be, have access to whatever sewer, water and sewer connections were there, that. Uh, the uh, various utilities like uh, the uh, power company had access to its power lines if there were any there and if the phone company had any phone lines that they needed access to and well, things like that. Well, let me ask this. In this case, with the financial ramifications that it has on the city, you would, of course, take that into account in deciding whether to grant it or not. Would you generally ask for a contribution? Well, if the, uh, or, the, what we would do is this. Uh, if the, uh, the, the city has various laws that relate to street and alley closings, one of which, for example, is that, they, uh, that if it were in the downtown area, as this is, in the DDD, as we call it in our comprehensive plan, it may be that uh, depending upon whether, it, for example, it enhanced the value of the property of the abutting property owners, uh, we may ask them to either build, uh, depending upon what they were, if they were building an office building, for example, they may have to build some housing there or if they weren't, there's a process by which they could get out of building housing by making a contribution to our uh, housing production trust fund. So there are some amenities associated with it, depending upon what, how much we enhance the, va the value. And also, I, if there were a loss of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a 
for example, income, and it's, as is the case here where you are losing parking meters and things like right. that, we would factor that into what we would require the property owners to pay the city as compensation. Okay. Thank you. What I'd like to do now, if there's no objection, if we have uh, uh, pleased to have the chairman of the city council here, uh, David Clark. And David, I need to swear you in your first, if you just to stand up. Instead. Right. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Just uh, very pleased to have you. I understand you were chairing a meeting on the arena yeah. prior to coming in. Uh, you yes. don't need to give us a report on that now. We can talk afterwards, but that's a vital uh, concern to all of us. But, well, uh, you had, we had consulted with your staff, and we were told that you wanted all that homework done before you went to uh, your July 12th hearing. And so we were Glad trying, to, hear trying to do that and had scheduled... Uh, this hearing that we had today before we got the word. We're, we're just we're glad to have you here and, and uh, go ahead and... Uh, That's the reason I'm late. Uh, and I'm not sure what my colleague, uh, Mr. Smith, has covered. Uh, he's certainly familiar with it all. I, uh, I've referred to his committee, the legislation that he and I introduced uh, by way of resolution into the council uh, to make a statement by the city council uh, with respect to the closure of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and its effect upon the city. Um, it is not a piece of legislation, although it is our general counsel's view and it is my view that under the District of Columbia Code, um, the council must be an approval posture, dis or disapproval posture, of a permanent alley closing, i.e. a closure where the title to the land actually uh, is conveyed. And uh, we have two different kinds of uses of the word uh, closure, alley or street closure. Um, that is the land kind of title that I've just spoken to. Uh, also, the question of stopping uh, some activities upon the street, which occurs uh, frequently throughout the city for various purposes. Um, so we, uh, uh, what we're dealing with with this resolution is a statement. Uh, we will see in the future whether we have to deal uh, with the issue of uh, the permanent alley clo closure uh, and what happens under that. Uh, not wanting to be repetitive, but if you'll forgive me and interrupt me if I'm wrong to be repetitive with my, my uh, colleague, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> uh, whose committee it is to see this matter, uh, he and I have introduced this resolution and on uh, May 26th, less than uh, a week after, uh, the restriction uh, was placed on us in our city, uh, uh, Mr. Smith's um, Committee on Housing and Urban Affairs had a hearing. And on June 22nd, it marked up its report and proposed resolution. And we're going to vote on that uh, in, uh, I think it's July 11th. And uh, um, the... Uh, uh, Proposed resolution will go before the council uh, on, as I said, uh, July 11th. Uh, the uh, vehicular restrictions that have already resulted and will continue to result in significant adverse, have significant adverse impacts upon the residents, the businesses, and the visitors in the District of Columbia, including adverse traffic impacts, that is vehicular circulation, parking, availability, and commercial loading and unloading, economic impacts, both direct and indirect impacts upon existing and new businesses, and upon short-term and long-term cost and foregone revenues to be borne by the District of Columbia, and upon the historic preservation uh, of our city and environmental impacts. It is our view that the federal government should immediately undertake and pay for the entire cost of both an environmental impact statement and study as defined by the National Environmental Protection Act and a historic resources study as defined in the National Historic Preservation Act. These federal laws establish processes which would provide an opportunity for public and governmental, federal and district participation in the identification, study, and cost of every short-term and long-term adverse impact resulting from the vehicular restrictions and the identification, study, and cost of each action necessary to eliminate or mitigate every adverse impact. The federal government should pay for the entire cost of eliminating or mitigating every adverse impact resulting from vehicular restrictions with federal funds um, that which are part of the annual federal payment to the district government 
uh, which are not part of the fe uh, annual federal payment, excuse me, to the District of Columbia, nor part of any other federal funds which would otherwise be provided to the district government and with regard, without regard to any expenditure limitations to which the district club government is subject. With Council Member Smith's Committee on Housing and Urban Development's hearing one month ago on this issue, there was overwhelming consensus amongst our business and residential communities that a process needs to be established to both identify and pay for the mitigation, mitigation of every adverse impact resulting from the federal government's vehicular restrictions in the economic and historic heart of our city. It is my view that the federal government's own laws, the National Environmental Policy Act and the National Historic Preservation Act, provide the best framework for these adverse impacts to be identified and mitigated. I applaud this committee for holding this hearing and encourage uh, your support for the establishment of such a process. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to testify uh, here today. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Clark. As to state the obvious, the, uh, the chairman has left to uh, go cast his vote, as was indicated with the uh, two-bell signal, uh, the idea being to try to keep the hearing in, in session and, and proceed and not uh, take more of your valuable time than, than is absolutely necessary. But if I could have another second of your time, another minute. Absolutely, ago. sir. I just read you my prepared uh, testimony. I had written it a couple of days ago, uh, sent it up here yesterday. Uh, and I've learned today uh, that something that was discussed in my office within 72 hours of the closure uh, when the Undersecretary of the Department of Treasury came to my office, the Director of the Highway Program of the Federal Government came to my office, the Director of the uh, Secret Service came to my office, uh, and it was said to us clearly uh, that although we, did not, we were not advised of this uh, until about uh, uh, 17 hours before the closure, um, that the uh, uh, Federal Government was willing, able, uh, to address the impact of it. Uh, during that discussion, it, it was said by the director of the, the highway director um, that uh, one possibility would be um, the problem that we were having during our financial crisis with making this about $16 million match on the highway funds. Uh, and not too long after that meeting, we were pleased to see that it was announced um, by the highway director and by Mayor Barry uh, that that uh, match uh, would be uh, excused, if you will, uh, the result being uh, that we could go ahead with $82 million worth of road programs in the District of Columbia this year and $90 million worth of programs next year. In the middle of all the crisis that we are, have, uh, that was uh, a, a welcome, that, very welcome. And I quipped that it took the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue to cause uh, that to happen. Uh, but now it appears that that might not really happen. And it appears that it might not really happen by a decision within or maybe in the end of the Congress of the United States. The people of the District of Columbia just can't take it anymore. I mean, we are, our people are moving slowly to work. Uh, it's very difficult for any of our people who work in the downtown area to get to work. It's very difficult for all of our people to go home every day. We understand that. We want to defend the safety of the President of the United States. But we can't be expected to not only endure all that, but to pay for the mitigation of that as well. Uh, so I have to come with a very strong word in addition to what I've written. And that strong word is the federal government just can't keep doing it to us. Um, they've done it to us with the pensions. They've legislated uh, pensions that we have to pay now over $300 million a year for, a $5.3 billion unfunded liability for it. Uh, they've uh, impacted our, our, our tax base in terms of the income tax. I'm not going to take this occasion to go into the commuter tax issue, uh, but they haven't addressed any alternatives for um, uh, a regional financing of the core. Uh, they put upon us, and we agreed to it, be putting upon us state functions. Um, but uh, uh, now that we recognize that the federal government is sort of the state and we're sort of the city, uh, there is no uh, uh, approaches to assuming those federal functions. They said that we need some discipline, which we do, in terms of the administration, expenditure of what we have, and we're cooperating with that. But then wham, there goes 82 million. Next year, 90 million. Wham, wham. Uh, because the federal government determines to close one street in our city. 
But that's the impact on us. And they were all, they were all well-meaning uh, uh, actions that the federal government took with those pensions and with all of those things. They were all well-meaning, but they wind up costing an awful lot of money, and we wind up having to pay for it. Well, Mr. Clark, I can certainly understand your concerns. Uh, it's not my place to speak for the chairman of this subcommittee, but uh, I do think it's fair to say in the uh, six months plus that I've been a member of this subcommittee in the 104th Congress, I think the chairman of the full committee, uh, Chairman Davis of the subcommittee, Mrs. Norton, and others have worked very hard to try to come to grips with many of the issues and problems that, that you uh, have very rightly stated here today. Uh, as to the uh, question of the matching funds, that is an issue that is being discussed uh, within Congress. Uh, the question is one of process. Did that administrator have the right to, in and of himself to make that waiver? Uh, that judgment has not been made. I will say that, uh, to my knowledge, both Mr. Davis and Mrs. Horton or, uh, Norton are working uh, on that issue as well. But that is the reason we are here today to uh, begin uh, to do, try to assess the uh, impact of this action on, on the district and on its residents and uh, what we might do to be helpful. Uh, with that, I would be uh, honored to yield to uh, Delegate Norton for any questions she might have. I know you have to. Or should we? Uh, I, I, I know you have to go to, to vote, Mr. Chairman, and I think probably we should let that happen. I wish I could accompany you. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to come right back, so if you want to go with questions, and I'm going to run over. Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. The uh, majority is, uh, is trusting the minority to continue at the moment. I, don't want, to, I want to make sure that uh, no vote is missed. Um, could I, uh, first, uh, let me just say that Mr. Clark's uh, concern could not be better placed. Um, we have had considerable help from the Congress on um, revenue matters, uh, but this one was especially important to us. We're getting tremendous help from the administration. We've gotten help from the speaker. We've gotten help uh, from Mr. Davis, and we thought everybody was on board. My good friend, Mr. Schuster, who has also been good to the district in his day, uh, objected to the waiver. The reason had to do, he said, with the fact that he himself had voted against a waiver for Pennsylvania at some point in the past. Uh, apparently, Pennsylvania was later able to work out a compromise that got it its funds, however. So we are continuing to work. Tom Davis and I are working very hard because this money will, will for all intents and purposes, be lost to us. I mean, there, there's a way you could get it, but in effect, you couldn't. Um, this is a union of states and the capital city. The notion that we could be on our financial knees and have to give up $82 million for streets that are more used may, <laughs> may uh, by tourists and commuters than they are by us is an irrational result. Uh, and you're right. We had thought this was all uh, going very well. I will say this, Mr. Schuster, I'm on the committee, the full, co the full commission. Mr. Schuster has said to me, my mind is not closed. Uh, and we are still working on that, but you are quite uh, right to bring that up at, at, at this point. And, and I want to assure you that the matter has not been, being, has not been dropped. It means jobs, it means streets, it really means everything at the moment. Uh, I wonder uh, if, if uh, any of you um, could compare the volume of traffic that were normally on the streets involved, 15th Street, 17th Street, Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, with other streets. It was this square, less, uh, under normal circumstances, before the closing, more busy, less busy, or on the average, simply as busy as other downtown streets? Um, uh, Ms. Norton, Larry King, Director of the Department of Public Works. Um, this street is a very busy street. It's one of our major east-west uh, arteries. And prior to the closing, it carried some 23,000 um, vehicles for a day. And um, uh, d directly after the closing, there was a significant drop off in traffic in the area as people scuttled to find alternate ways around. That traffic has now found its way back to H Street and I Street. Um, because people, it just takes too long to find other ways around. So I believe that the, um, um, 
the, uh, well, the, the traffic is The reason I asked for the relative, uh, uh, because I, re I really have only a guesstimate from my mm -hmm. own experience as a Washingtonian. And I know I always avoid 15th Street. This is before the closing. Yeah. I always avoided 15th Street and 17th Street because they, in non-rush hour, rush hour, yeah. I tried to find myself another street. And, the re and, and in Pennsylvania Avenue, I suppose if you could get there because it was wide enough, might not be as bad. But 15th Street and 17th Street were two streets uh, when you're trying to figure out where, how to go that I always avoided. And maybe that was simply an anecdotal perception. Yeah. But I'm trying to compare that square block with any okay. comparable uh, blocks so that I will have, or, or perhaps you will ha have some relative sense of what, what uh, kind of traffic we were already dealing with there. I mean, this is the kind of question we might have asked ourselves before this happened in the first place, <laughs> before they closed in the first place. It might have helped us to know how to go about it. Uh, Excuse Norton, me. If, if I may interrupt, and I do apologize, uh, uh, neither Chairman Davis nor I are as young as we used to be. He's taking a bit longer to get back. Uh, I need a little bit longer to get over. As you know, we are in strict 17-minute vote, so I, I am going to have to call for a, what I hope will be a very short... Uh, <laughs> well, he's getting better. <laughs> so, nice talking to you all. We're doing this thing right now. Okay, got that. That was like making it from third base at home. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, you were about. I understand that I can proceed. Uh, <laughs> well, we um, could you Norton, just give me some relative comparison? I know I know that's difficult, but I'm trying to assess uh, the, the the relative difference, frankly. It's going to be difficult to state that right now, but we are, and with the help of the Federal Highway Administration, conducting a study that would give us exactly that information. And oh, well, we, I appreciate that. If a study is going to make those comparisons, you're right. We it, should wait for that. And it uh, compare before and after, and not only just this square, but the whole downtown area uh, from um, Massachusetts Avenue to the north to uh, North Capitol to the east. Uh, and the Potomac River and Rock Creek Park, the other directions. Mm -hmm. Do you yet know how many parking places have been lost or how much parking revenue has been lost to the district? Yeah, um, we, we have the uh, parking revenue that we've lost to date, $62,000 in parking revenue. That includes meters as well as uh, we also know how many tickets are generally given on, on each meter I bet in you town, <laughs> so that's factored in also. That money, I take it, is not being reimbursed. It's part of what we're asking for. Yeah, yeah it's part of what, we, what we're asking for. We think it should be reimbursed. It has not been reimbursed yet. There were, there were promises to reimburse the district for certain expenses. I would like to know, and they even named the federal government, the Treasury Department, named some of those expenses. Could you give me an idea of what expenses they have already said they would reimburse? Well, the uh, Federal Highway Administration has uh, uh, given us $165,000 to ease the traffic and street uh, problems that uh, this, this caused. Um, there is, uh, as Mr. Um, Rogers indicated, the uh, Treasury has indicated it would reimburse us for the uh, police, Metro and police, uh, during the traffic duty. And that's entered into the record, the uh, amount for each intersection. Uh, that, uh, the, the total, we, we think, is about $450,000. But they have not said that specifically they will reimburse us for lost parking meters? Not yet. Now, beyond the parking meters, you, ha you spoke in your testimony, I don't know if it was Mr. Rogers or Mr. Clark, about the detail of uh, police who are directing traffic. Yes. yes. And suppose those police, and you also indicated that they are not there permanently. No. Temporary assignment, off-duty police officers. Right. Why is it, yeah. by the way, why are they voluntarily there? You say it was a voluntary detail. Yeah. Well, um, why are they simply assigned there, and the city reimbursed, or somebody else assigned there? Well, if 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 they're off duty, 
you know, that it certainly has to be voluntary. I see. And uh, Oh, yeah, I see. These are people who have already, I see, right. I understand. They've done their tour of duty and this is additional work. I see. Yeah. That's the, um, the money to pay them, to pay the, the detail, comes up front rather than being reimbursed? Uh, no, that, I don't know about that. I don't know that specific detail. That's worked out between MPD and the Treasury. Treasury. Yeah. I, for the record, I'd like to know that in okay. light of the district shortfalls, if there's sure. going to be money involved, we reimbursement does not seem to me to be the best way during this period to deal with it. And I appreciate that information within okay. the next week. Um, if, if this detail were to be pulled back next week, what would be the effect on traffic? Well, we believe that uh, with uh, the signs and the fact that we've had uh, police officers out for the amount of time we've had them out and uh, the uh, media letting people know the change in the traffic patterns, that it would be minimal in the future. But also, we just have to take a look at it. You know, you don't know these things until you, until you actually try them. I know the first day of the switchover of H and I, uh, there were certain, certain intersections that police, I went down, I talked to a number of them, indicated that um, traffic flowed real well, they didn't have any problems. There were a number that they had tremendous problems with in terms of people wanting to turn the wrong way and that kind of thing. I think by the time that they end the detail, I believe it's July 14th, that uh, traffic uh, will know where to go and will, uh, won't have to worry about uh, people turning in the wrong direction. Well, they won't have to worry about that, but you testified that 15th and 17th streets were among the busiest, yeah, busiest. arteries. You exactly. can't make the relative comparison, but you are willing right. to say they were among the busiest arteries. I've certainly uh, been to those streets since. Mm -hmm. Now, assuming everybody knows which way to, traf to, to turn, what does that have to do with the volume of cars that will be going up and down 15th and 17th Street? Uh, the volume of cars are going to be, um, I mean, pretty much the same. Uh, people uh, are going to various places. Uh, as you know, uh, 15th kinda, kinda, and 17th gets you to Connecticut and to and K Street and, and, and to go north and to e, uh, east and west. So it's, it's kind of uh, a major way. It's always going to have a lot of traffic on it. Um, as uh, I think all of you perhaps know, when in the morning when Congress and staff come and in the evening when we leave uh, down at South Capitol and all around the Capitol, there are policemen and women who direct traffic. And they do so because this is a capital complex and they want to keep the traffic going and because they feel an obligation to keep traffic going in this federal area. Now, Pennsylvania Avenue has been closed off for exclusively federal reasons. We just heard testimony that while people may know which way to turn, uh, the volume of traffic is not likely to change. Having been on those streets, the, <coughs> the, the traffic cops seem to have kept the traffic moving uh, fairly smoothly. If they are not there, considering the way in which H Street right. is shaped, considering that commuters come up 15th, use 15th Street to come up 17th Street to go back, uh, this non-traffic expert uh, sees, sees real chaos and, and clogging of the arteries there. And uh, I'm wondering if you think it would be appropriate for um, some agency of the federal government to make policemen available around this uh, closure that it has made available around the uh, Capitol complex. Ms. Norton, could I... Just add uh, one thing to that, please, uh, and that is that, as you well know, the White House is one of the favorite uh, points of contact for visitors who come here. This city not only has our own residents and, the, and our own uh, commuters who come back and forth to work every day, but we also have 18 million tourists, uh, of which the White House is, is a favorite point.
point that they come to visit. And many of them have chosen to do it on tour buses and their own automobiles by driving. They could get close enough to see it and make a photograph. They're going to be unable to do that now. And that traffic now is going to mix up with this traffic circulating around the White House. And that may be a reason there to think about some uh, continued federal involvement, if for no other reason than to move the tourist traffic along, because that is going to create a major problem for us uh, as they mix up with this commuting traffic, which now must uh, use the uh, one-way streets that have been designed primarily for the purpose of moving the commuter traffic, uh, people who are moving back and forth to their places of work and back and forth home. So that is something that uh, we have to look at. And I might add that these people now will have to disembark from their automobiles and walk to get a view of the White House so they can make that photograph. With no place for the automobiles And there's to no be. place for that automobile to park. Right. Uh, and so that's something that I think that uh, that the federal government and uh, our local government ought to work together on to try to find a way to offer some relief to the rest of America uh, for whom this is a destination, uh, and not only the rest of America, I guess the rest of the world too, which comes here to visit uh, Washington and they wouldn't want to leave this city without getting a glimpse of the White House and one photograph of them standing close enough so they can say they've been here. And uh, they ought to have an opportunity to do that and I think we ought to try to make it convenient for them to do that. Uh, and so that's a major issue for us, and it's something that we do have to work out as we go through this. And, and that's a major consideration for this committee and also for our mm -hmm. government. One wonders, again, it, it seems to me that, that we ought to simply let our minds float on all the options and possibilities mm -hmm. as they were not allowed to do beforehand, apparently, for security reasons. But, for example, is there any reason why security, but, uh, sorry, any security reasons why tour buses shouldn't be allowed to go in the area? I mean, assuming that the same person comes every day with a, you know, and you have his uh, ID, why, and since you can open the area or let some, some, some people through, why should the 20 million tourists be punished if there is an alternative that's viable? Do you all know of any security reasons why, that, why perhaps a, a tour bus might, uh, should be kept out of the area? Or, or other reasons other than security? Uh, I, I think... Um Congressman, I'll leave that to uh, the termination of the Secret Service and the Treasury people. Well, see, we, that's just a problem. Yeah. Is it that <laughs> we leave it to the se Secret Service is where we got well, where we are. I, 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 I understand that, but, you know, we, we did have a, have, a, have a briefing. There are some issues. There are some concerns that... Uh, yeah, uh, I had a briefing, too, but frankly, my briefing did not lead me to believe that, that tour buses were the problem uh, or were likely to carry a car bomb or the rest. I mean, I really think that what the problem we have is one of give and take. And everybody has been very rational, very grown up. Nobody's going to endanger the President of the United States. That's all give. I mean, that's all take as far as they're concerned. But it, at, at some point, when we consider the tourists and their effect on our own revenue, right. the fact that some people stay an extra day in this town just to get to go see the, the White House, uh, that, uh, that as a uh, council member, uh, as the council member just said, we don't, uh, if they get out of their buses, uh, their buses have no place to stay. We have a real problem here. And one, one way is just go on and get your bus through. Uh, and we won't let other folks through. What's the street that, that comes off of H Street, uh, which Ma is a federal street? Madison I or Jackson? Ja ja yeah, Jefferson. Jackson Place. Jefferson. I know the, 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 the buses can go down there. Yeah. The bu your your metro. your uh, metro buses yeah. Yeah. can continue. They go down there, I guess, Madison, to wait. Yes. They, Do they go down there to wait until they turn their no, they, route around? They wait on H and then they turn uh, down Madison to get back to 15. And, and then and, and then they come back up. Yes, and they turn back up. And they turn 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 around and come. So for the convenience of the metro buses, they have done that. Well, we, we have got we've got to think of of and those are buses. They could be carrying a car bomb. But they're not because they, you know, everybody knows who the bus driver is, or he has some identification, so they let them down there. Uh, um, none of these things are obvious, and it'll take will and determination to say what are our laws and how can we mitigate our laws. And if the metro buses can go down there, I don't see why the tour buses cannot go across Pennsylvania Avenue and, and uh, retain some convenience for members of the public uh, and others. I want to ask you one more question. That's about emergency. Uh, here we have on, on one side George Washington University Hospital, very close to this area. Do you know of uh, any arrangements that have been made or, or is an ambulance put in the same position of having to find a detour around very crowded streets 
to get to the emergency room of George Washington University Hospital? At, at, this, at this time, um, only emergency vehicles that need to access the White House or the residences along uh, Jefferson or Madison or Pennsylvania Avenue in the closed area would be allowed in the uh, uh, barricaded area. So uh, they would have to find their way around unless they were providing some emergency service right in that block. Uh, I also like to say that we did broach the whole idea of let, allowing tour buses to do the same thing as the metro buses, and uh, that was uh, was well, we told uh, Secret Service that, and they did not uh, think that was appropriate either. Did they give a reason? Did they give a reason? Security, security concerns okay. is their normal reason. You for know, that's a, like in the McCarthy yeah. era, they said national security. You weren't supposed to ask any more questions. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we simply have to draw out the, the reasons for that. Uh, Chairman Clark, uh, I seem to recall that, that there are circumstances where alley closings result in a quid pro quo. Is that routinely yeah. done? When an alley closing? No, it's uh, routine, routinely done. Well, the council has set some standards uh, for that, uh, that uh, when people come in and get an alley closed or a street closed, um, then we look at things like sprinkling and, uh, for fire protection, and if they displace uh, 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 small businesses, they have to provide for relocation for that. Um, we've, we've done that in legislated standards, and we've now legislated standards uh, for a contribution to the development of housing in the city. Uh, and there's a complicated formula as to whether that should be in downtown, which can be market rate, or whether it's to be anywhere in the city uh, at low and moderate income rates, uh, moderate being a family of uh, uh, four with an income of $50,000 or less. And so we have done that. Uh, and we have said that if somebody gets the uh, be uh, benefits of uh, land uh, by virtue of the city's action of closing the alley or closing the street, um, there must be uh, some remuneration to the, to the city for doing that. And that's what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, um, con you were here, but Congressman Davis was not. Uh, that, no, I think I mentioned this in the early part of my statement, that uh, the testimony I gave uh, in writing was with respect to a resolution we had before us, but we have not yielded on the point that we don't have the authority to actually close the alley, I mean, close the street itself through the uh, authority the council has had since pre home rule days, uh, it's been written that we close that and the standards that I've just <clears throat> talked to are, are standards that we've employed. And Congressman Davis, you were away, and I, but I definitely want you to, to hear some of what I said. Um, and because you uh, uh, deal with our District of Columbia Affairs in many, many respects other than just transportation. Um, and that is that uh, uh, this is going to hurt a lot. It's been hurting a lot. Um, uh, the executive branch officials are very diplomatic. I'm not always the most diplomatic person. Uh, and our people are really hurting it there. Uh, the difficulty in traffic is not just uh, I Street and 8th Street. I happen to live up uh, 16th Street on 17th Street. Um, and the backup from downtown, getting downtown as far up into the residential neighborhoods, up beyond Meridian Hill. I mean, you've got to be back up, up beyond Meridian Hill to get down uh, to the White House. That's an effect of what's going on down there. Now, when they get down there, yes, police officers do direct them now. We're glad to have that up, I understand, into July 14th. Um, I don't know whether you're, you're reimbursing us now or not or paying directly, but I think you should look at the complications of reimbursement versus direct payment, because by reimbursement, we still pay that money as expenses under that $3.2 billion cap. And these are still expenses, reimbursed or not. Uh, it appears the way our financial authority issues are, are working now, even if we get additional revenues, uh, um, that doesn't help us because we still cannot spend. And if you give us $100 and we go spend $100, we still spend $100 against that cap. Uh, we happen right now to be projecting $3.3 billion worth of revenues. We're still capped $3.2 billion Mr. Clark, in terms of expenditure. Dave, I'll tell you what, if, if, if it's that 165000 or whatever that breaks the $3.254 uh, uh, billion dollar cap, if that's the difference, I'll go to bat for no, you. More, uh, more if than that's that, the only six, difference we got, I'm going to be a happy man. It's $16, it's 16 million on the matching. 
the cost of which to the city, and this I explained when you were gone, well, is $82 I, 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 million. Dollars. I, I missed that. It's Good. not the subject of this hearing, but I will address it. But I will address this because I had occasion to talk to the Speaker about it and Mr. Wolf last night, talked to Mrs. Norton, and like everything that goes on up here, it's always very, very complicated. Uh, trying to get anything through uh, with the district through a, uh, members with diverse views, and you have the same problem at the council meeting. But uh, that is a major priority for us uh, to to work that uh, issue and resolve that issue uh, in the way that we had agreed to do, and that means without the district having to uh, reimburse it, at least not any time uh, in the near future. I think we're going to be successful. I think it's a temporary setback, and uh, don't give up on it. You've got a lot of uh, people here that uh, are working very hard on that and making that a priority. Oh, so wow. I think we'll get it taken care of. It's not done today. There are other vehicles if we can't resolve it well, here. I just wanted to set you straight that uh, I feel confident by the time we're through that you'll get that uh, waiver. Well, um, uh, you speak of reimbursement later. And I understand that's what they did do in Pennsylvania. Um, but in Pennsylvania, they didn't come and take uh, the, the street in front of the Liberty Bell uh, they, 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 and make the Pennsylvanians pay for it. Uh, and we're looking at the long range, too, now, as we look at all these financial problems. Um, and that's why we're pushing on pensions and everything else, because they're long range issues as well as just short term issues. So if we say we have to reimburse no, I understand. that Listen, money later, you, you're, not, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir. For. You're preaching to the choir. I under, understand that's one of the reasons we're holding this hearing is to right. make sure we understand that you're a very strong advocate. I would just say on the reimbursement issue, I think we're going to resolve that favorably to the uh, city, uh, short term and long, long term. The other issues will work as well. Uh, you, of course, I think have your hands full trying to meet, comply with some of the other congressional mandates on spending, and I know you're uh, going to uh, to do that. Uh, but that uh, I mean, I'm going to ask Ms. Uh, Ms. Norton I just if you're make through, and then I want to I'm, recognize I'm, I'm, Mr. I'm through, except I want to say this right here and now. If the council has, I think, justifiably required private businesses who do business in this city paying considerably more taxes than they would pay if they chose to do businesses elsewhere. Uh, to pay a quid pro quo, again, justifiably, to get an alley closing. It is unthinkable that the federal government would be allowed to close down not only a major thoroughfare, but a thoroughfare that is an attraction for revenue for the district, because it is certainly the major tourist thoroughfare without paying the same kind of quid pro quo for that closing that somebody who does business and pays taxes has to pay. It is a virtual taking, and un uh, it, it is uncompensated. And I appreciate the testimony because it's on the basis of that testimony and understanding your, uh, your uh, general procedures and practices that it seems to me now perfectly plain that the district is owed compensation even for the temporary restriction, as, as they would call it. It has cost us temporarily, or I should say permanently, already millions of dollars. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Norton, thank you very much. Uh, we have a happy day. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Michael, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I, I, I wanted, wanted to add that. Um, it's not just about Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, we have requests uh, in the wake of uh, Oklahoma City uh, from several other federal agencies that would like parking restrictions in front of their buildings, that would like for us to take out you know, parking meters. So I think that uh, we're going to need to work together with the Council and the, and, and the Congress to have some way of, uh, of handling this issue. And uh, as the Chairman points out, it's not just about reimbursement, but but there's, you know, there's impact on the businesses in our community as well. And uh, we want to work with you on, on, on a way to resolve this uh, federal government, district government uh, issue. Mr. Rogers, let me just say I appreciate that. And Dave, I appreciate your comments as, as well. And I, uh, as you know, this was an executive branch decision. Nobody called Mrs. Norton and asked her what she thought about it. They didn't call me. They didn't call the speaker. Uh, that's where the decision came from in this case. And we're trying to deal with it equitably. Uh, this starts as a form of oversight hearing. What may follow, I think, uh, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but we want to know what the effect is on the city. We want to know some of the unintended consequences of this action. 
and so that we can deal with them uh, effectively. And I, I would just say, uh, Mr. Rogers, we continue this dialogue. We need to stay informed so that we are aware of uh, all the consequences of decisions made by the Secret Service, made by other federal agencies uh, as we move ahead and so that the city is treated uh, uh, fairly and as a partner uh, in, in this process. And because of the timing of this, there was really, I, I gather, time not to, I got a call the night before. And uh, in fact, I didn't get, I was not there the night before. I got picked it up the next morning and said, Dad called uh, Mr. Rubin and had a phone number now. I didn't know what it was about, but he just put it down there next to the sports page. Uh, and uh, I, I, happened, I happened to uh, see it the next morning and called at 8 on a Saturday. And he was in his office, <laughs> explained that he tried to get, but we were, of course, not consulted. But right. uh, hopefully, this is the part of a dialogue with you and the executive branch, and we're going to continue our dialogue at this level uh, okay. as well. We've, we've continued this. So we are going to have differences, but I think we have more in common, and we're trying to, to keep those common bonds uh, uniting us as we go after uh, the waiver on the matching money and those kind of things where we recognize it's not just in the city's interest, it's in the region's interest and the nation's interest uh, to waive some of these things and not treat you like Pennsylvania. You're a city. And if they want to make you a state, then they can treat you like Pennsylvania. Uh, as we move through these. So uh, I appreciate it. I'm going to recognize now the uh, Vice Chairman of the Committee, gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Gooding. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being late. We've got uh, two meetings going on at the same time. We've got votes on the floor. Uh, if you would indulge me, Mr. Chairman, I do want to uh, make a comment that has nothing to do with uh, related to uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, but well, that you won't be the first one to do that here. Today, I, I'm so. not giving an opening statement, but I do want to say publicly and on the record that uh, there's a editorial this morning in the in the Wall Street Journal that talks about uh, school choice, and I, I, I want to congratulate uh, uh, Mayor Barry and uh, School Superintendent Franklin Smith uh, for something that they're uh, embarking upon with the Washington D.C. schools relative to. Uh, uh, privatizing some of the schools and offering perhaps some kind of a limited voucher plan. Uh, obviously, I, I think I would like to see them go even further with that, but uh, uh, when elephants fly, you don't criticize them for not staying up there very long. And, and uh, so I'm, uh, I just wanted to say that for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman. Secondly, I would also say that I, I'm not convinced, uh, and we've had several uh, briefings about this issue and about security around the, the Capitol. Um, I, I remain uh, a healthy skeptic as to whether or not we should be going as far as we, we are. Um, in fact, I think of the two most serious uh, security breaches uh, that we've seen around the White House, neither one uh, closing off Pennsylvania Avenue would have done anything about. One gentleman flew an airplane into the White House, another gentleman uh, climbed a fence, and it wouldn't have made any difference whether you could close off all the streets if somebody wants to use an airplane, uh, it seems to me. Um, <laughs> But, but I do want to get uh, finally down to the specific subject area of this hearing today. And I understand you've talked a little bit about this formula. Uh, can you tell us a little more about how you're determining what these costs are, what kind of a formula you're going to use, uh, Mr. Rogers or uh, Ms. Clark? I'll, I'll start. Um, in, in each case, if, if we are, um, for instance, um, have costs associated with changing uh, street signs. I mean, that's labor, that's material. If we are asked, uh, having to uh, uh, remove parking, parking meters or impose restrictions that uh, are revenue generating, uh, you know, there's a record that's identifiable. There may be others. Yeah. Um, yes, and uh, also we uh, we'd, uh, estimated the cost for all the traffic uh, mitigation measures, changing the streets and what have you, and so uh, we have actual well, estimated costs for that, and we have been drawing down from the Federal Highway Administration, we put up a pot of money to take care of that. On um, parking, as Mr. Rogers says, uh, we have a record of how much each meter brings in, not only in just the meter revenue, but also ticket revenue, and also there is a specific number of hours that the Metropolitan Police of uh, Officers are um, staffing the intersections for traffic control and we know how much that costs. So this is not so much a formula as uh, uh, actually looking at historic and actual costs and then saying this is what it's going to take. Sir, <clears throat> that, that, that is correct with re respect to those costs. Um, <clears throat> but there's greater cost. And part of what I testified to 
um, is the resolution that Mr. Smith and I introduced, which has been reported by his committee we're going to vote on in a way of requesting things. Uh, and that's a, uh, an impact, uh, environmental impact statement, other than just the green grass in the ground around Lafayette Square, but the uh, impact statement that goes to uh, the whole area, including particularly the businesses. And there's businesses of every level. So there's major uh, uh, national, maybe international corporations located in that, in that area. Um, there's uh, um, medium level businesses such as the tour buses that we've talked about. Uh, vendors or street vendors or licensed businesses paying taxes in the District of Columbia, completely wiped out, just wiped out. And there's a larger amount of impact in terms of on the city than just paying a police officer a straight time, they're on voluntary service, up until July 14th. Um, and then giving us the money, and we put that into our payments, and I was talking about that running up against the cap. Um, and there is bigger, there's bigger impacts. Uh, and we were talking earlier about the fact that the, six, uh, the administration's suggestion that we uh, be uh, relieved of the $16 million match for the federal match um, uh, would not only save us that $16 million, but make available $82 million this year that might not otherwise be available and $90 million next year just because we weren't able to make those matches. So it goes a little bit beyond just paying a police officer straight time uh, when he's volunteering between now uh, and two weeks from now, July 14th, when in the middle of the summer, when nobody's really here, that service stops, and when September 6th, the day you come back, and the day everybody else comes back to Washington, uh, we're going to have a major track of champion. So we're looking at it, but it just has to go beyond just the dollars that the administrator talked about. The federal government, as I said in my testimony, should finance an exhaustive economic study uh, of what uh, this means in the economy of our city. Um, there, that, so that would be the cost. And if I could take the fact that you went into an additional issue to go on the virtue of answering your question into a related issue, but it's not exactly uh, there, the parking in the area was addressed before. We do have legislation that Mrs. Norton has introduced down here um, to authorize uh, us to go forward with a program that we've legislated in the council for a parking authority in the District of Columbia to cre create more parking down here. Um, that's one of three pieces, along with the convention center and the arena, that I think you're going to hold a hearing on on uh, July 12th. But if that can get in place, um, then we might have a capability to create some more uh, parking. Thank well, the, the reason I raised the issue of the formula, and I think it's going to be important, I, I, you, you will be much more persuasive not only bef and before this committee, but I think especially under Mr., in front of Mr. Walsh's committee, if you, if you can uh, justify that. Because let me just say, if you talk about parking, I mean, uh, my own assumption would be that if people don't park at one meter, they're going to have to park at another meter. I mean, it, it's, it's not meter. like they're not going to park somewhere. They, you know, no. everybody has to be somewhere and everybody has to park somewhere. And the same would be true with the parking revenue. I mean, I used to have this debate, particularly as it related to uh, economic development. Uh, for example, when we brought the Super Bowl to Minnesota, and we, we saw these incredible economic uh, projections of how much that was worth to the state of Minnesota. Uh, but one of, the, one of the assumptions, I think, in the formula was that if they hadn't had it there, no one would be staying in the hotels and eating meals in, you know, in, in the, the Twin Cities. You know, that's not really true. I think we all know that uh, those rooms, th those hotels would have been 70 percent full uh, approximately on any given night. And so you're really talking about the margins. And I, and I would hope that you would, you would uh, uh, get more specific about what formula you're going to use if you're going to come up and, and tell us how much it's going to cost. Secondly, though, and I think more to the point, or another point that I would like to raise if I've got, oh, my red light is on. Can I have another minute here? Um, what are the status, uh, what is the status of your negotiations with the executive branch uh, over these security issues and, and, uh, and uh, reimbursement for uh, any potential expenses? Uh, we've uh, had uh uh, discussions with the uh, executive branch to the tune of uh, $165,000 million, $165, for uh, uh, traffic-related uh, issues. Uh, Federal Highway has already put money up for that, and we draw down against that. Um, there's other costs which are reimbursable, which are for police officers, and et cetera. Uh, also, uh, our, um, there's direct payment to Metro for the cost uh, of Metro 
There's um, additional what, what cost. What cost is Metro? I'm there's a um, relocation of bus shelters. There's uh, changes in bus routes, which uh, increase the driver time. And we subsidize Metro for their cost. And when it goes above what we've uh, agreed to uh, based on these changes, uh, and that's about $45,000 for that latter, 23000 for relocating uh, shelters. Let, let me also speak to parking. And you say if someone doesn't park in one meter, they'll park in another. Uh, there are 245,000 regulated parking spaces in the District of Columbia. On any given day, there's a million to a million and a half cars in the District of Columbia. Uh, they're not going, if you take parking away, they're not going to park at another place, a meter, because there is not another meter for okay. them to park at. So that, that's our dilemma there. Uh, we, when we take parking out, we definitely lose revenue. And I, I can, and I can uh, verify that. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I might just be at, uh, I'm allowed to add one thing to that. Um, I might uh, just tell you that uh, the person who took your place out in the county, Mrs. Manley, when she and I served on the Metro Board, told me a story about driving into the District of Columbia one day to do some shopping. <clears throat> she looked around and couldn't find a meter, tried to park at a hotel where she would have paid a lot of money to park, couldn't find a parking place, so she went back home. So you, you don't, if you don't find a meter here, you may not find a meter, and I'm sure we lost, uh, she's known as a big shopper. I'm sure she would have done a lot of shopping if she had yes, been able she, to find a place to park. Uh, <laughs> but let me also add um, one other thing. That was a big loss for you that day, I <laughs> think. <laughs> she, don't, don't tell her I said that. I, I'm sure. She, I'm sure I, uh, but let me also add one other thing about the, this issue of the impact of this. Uh, one of the things that we did as a result of this closing was to uh, negotiate an arrangement with Riggs Bank. You, you may remember that on the north side of Pennsylvania Avenue between 15th Street and uh, Madison Avenue, the Riggs Bank is the, actually the only privately owned business on that street. Now, there's a nation's bank there, too, but its entrance actually is on 15th Street. Riggs, uh, this is their original headquarters, I understand, of the bank. It's an historic property. They have invested a tremendous amount of money into fixing this property up. When this street was closed, the, the president of Riggs Bank called me up and said, basically, you all put me out of business. I don't have any more customers. My customers can't drive in here anymore. And they, they uh, actually had, uh, at that point, they had already talked to the Treasury Department and said there's no security problem with people coming to my bank to <laughs> deposit money. And the Treasury Department said that if we could get uh, the Public Works Department to agree, they could open it up and put a little cul-de-sac in there so that they could, uh, people could. And you may notice that there's a cul-de-sac in there now. But my point is that they described this to me as a taking, basically that we had just devalued their property, we had taken it from them, they, it was, uh, they, if they had to get rid of it, obviously it would be worth a lot less because you couldn't get in there with any kind of vehicular traffic. And uh, they, they couldn't even get in there for their uh, uh, loading and unloading for their, uh, uh, for their uh, loading and unloading purposes. So my point is that in the light of hearing not only that, but also the President's statement recently that there may be some other changes around these other buildings around the city, obviously the city has to be very concerned about this because we're not only talking about just the question of reimbursing police officers and, and parking meters and trying to rearrange traffic, but we also may see some tremendous impact out here in some of our, uh, in some of our economic community, which is going to have a, uh, uh, which is already suffering and, and needs relief rather than some other encumbrances. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all very much. If, any other questions? If not, we'll excuse this panel and just say to all of you, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments, and I hope this will be a continuing dialogue. And I, we're going to emphasize to the executive branch how important it is that they continue to work with you on this and other issues uh, uh, like this. You pointed up, I think, some uh, major failings in the current system, and uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you. you. We have, um, as this panel leaves, we'll move to our second panel, and I will call up uh, Uh, Gregory uh, uh, Faza Curley, let's see if I pronounced that right, who's the president of the uh, District Columbia Building and Industry Association. Dr. Henry Fernandez, who's the chairman of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission. Um, uh, Lawrence Reuter, who's the general manager of uh, WMATA. Uh, Ms. Margaret Jeffers, the executive director of the District of Columbia Apartment and Office Building Association. And Mr. Uh, is miss anybody? M Mildred Say, the Director of Planning for the Washington Metropolitan, oh, M Mildred Say is going to be doing the, uh, uh, in lieu of, uh, of, of, of a writer, good, that's fine. And uh, Ken Hoffer, the Executive Director of the uh, D.C. Area Tracking Association. Hey, I'm sorry. 
what I have to do is swear everybody in. If you would not all mind standing and raising your hands. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Let's see my script. <coughs> All right. Um, thank you. You can be seated. Okay. Any written statements that you have uh, submitted will be made part of the record, and I'd like you to proceed for a five-minute oral statements, uh, commencing with Mr. Uh, uh, Fazal Curley. And let me say, we may have a vote uh, about ten minutes from now. I'm advised. What I'd like to ask is if I could go first uh, and turn the gavel over to Mr. Gutnick and. If I'm not back in 10 minutes, then you could recess the meeting briefly, but that way we'll lose as little time as possible. We'll be able to move ahead with testimony and uh, a number of questions that I know uh, uh, that we have for the uh, panelists. Uh, Mr. Fonskirli, please uh, welcome and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Chairman Davis, um, members of this committee. I'm Greg Fazakerly, Chairman and CEO of DRI. Where I, I was close. I mean, physically, I was no, close. No, I know. That, that was a gold star close. I mean, that was real close. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but I'm Greg. That's a lot easier. Uh, our company is a development company here in the District of Columbia. Uh, I'm also a resident of the city. As president of the District of Columbia Building Industry Association, I should like to take a few moments to express the views of our association as they relate to the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. In assembling those views, I've taken the opportunity to discuss the closing uh, with as many people as I could doing business in the downtown area. My comments here today, therefore, are necessarily anecdotal, and I might suggest that we all think about a lot of the testimony today as being just that, anecdotal. We're trying to give our best shot, but I think these anecdotal comments do represent opinions and observations that are quite consistent. The closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, in short, has had a negative impact on business in and around the immediate downtown area, which of course is no surprise even from, even from the testimony you've heard today. A major east-west traffic artery in the central business district of this city has been blocked. Commuting times have gotten longer, parking more difficult, and for retailers, pedestrian traffic patterns have been disrupted, sales are off, and office tenants looking to relocate are now unsure about where to go. In short, there have been dramatic impacts arising from essentially dividing the downtown. I'm sure you've heard a lot and you'll be hearing more this afternoon about those effects. But at this point, however, I should like to comment on another observation consistently made in my discussions with the business community. No one I've talked to is attempting to second guess the decision that closing Pennsylvania Avenue was necessary to properly protect the president. The essential point, I feel, is that the closing and its impact dramatically illustrate the close and unique relationship that exists between the federal government and the District of Columbia. Actions taken by the federal government can and do have a direct effect on the daily lives of the residents and businesses of this city. It is a relationship that very clearly calls for communication, coordination, and collaboration. I understand that security considerations dictated the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue be done promptly. The public study of the issue before the fact might indeed have given rise to the kind of action the closing was intended to avert. Nevertheless, such public study is necessary, albeit after the fact, to formulate a response that minimizes the negative impacts of the closing and takes us from an anecdotal level to a more factual level. I also understand that such a study is to be commissioned by the Federal Highway Administration. I hope that is, in fact, the case. We need a professional economic impact study and a sound long-term traffic plan. That is just common sense. My own experience also su strongly suggests that both the federal and city governments, both the federal and city governments, should participate in defining the scope of the study and in the active review of its findings and recommendations. Departing from my testimony, what I'm trying to say there clearly is that the local government and the federal government be equal participants and owners of that study. I would also urge both governments to solicit the close participation of all of us in the business community in conducting the study. Again, I think a fairly common sense recommendation. 
Accordingly, the, D the DC Building Industry Association is prepared to volunteer the experience and expertise of its members. This is not only an opportunity to address a particular problem, that is, to mitigate the long-term consequences of the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. It is also a larger opportunity to demonstrate that the federal government, the city, and the Washington business community can work together. And with that collaboration, we can better address other problems arriving, arising out of our unique relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. I appreciate that. Um, let me move to uh, Dr. Henry Fernandez, Chairman of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission 2B, and then to uh, Millard Say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, good afternoon to all the other members of the uh, committee. I am Henry Fernandez, a uh, resident of DuPont Circle and the Chairman of the uh, DuPont Circle Advisory Neighborhood Commission 2B. This ANC is located in Ward 2 in the northwest west section of the, of the district. The southern end of the DuPont Circle ANC roughly covers the area bounded by 15th Street on the east, Pennsylvania Avenue on the south, and 20th Street on the west. The stretch of Pennsylvania Avenue closed off by the Secret Service is located along the southern end of the DuPont Circle ANC. On May 10, 1995, at the regularly scheduled meeting of the ANC, the seven commissioners unanimously passed a motion opposing the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. Uh, Commissioner Jonathan Heller, who introduced the motion before the ANC, is here today also with me. In my opinion, Mr. Chairman, the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue appears to be unwarranted and capricious and has caused unnecessary inconveniences and wasted money. Equally important, due notice was not given to those who live and work in the and to provide alternative measures which may have enhanced security around the White House. Now, while not being privy to the um, alleged security concerns, if in the opinion of experts uh, the alleged threats on the life of the President were to be valid, I would personally support the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. But why just close Pennsylvania Avenue? Um, obviously, we know that these readily available um, explosive materials, which can cause severe damage to the White House, um, were ha had to be transported um, by a large truck. Um, why not simply ban trucks or delivery vans from the vicinity of the White House? Uh, Ms. Norton um, mentioned before tour buses or metro buses um, are also another possibility that could pass by. Unfortunately, the President, other public officials in the White House, and all other government buildings will never be completely free from the possibility of a terrorist attack. Why did the Secret Service choose to close the avenue? Is the probability, probability of a terrorist attack on the President's life more likely to come from the front of the White House than from other places? Does the Secret Service have any plans to close Hotel Washington across the street from the Treasury Building, which has guest rooms and a rooftop restaurant overlooking the private quarters of the White House? I have eaten on the top of the um, roof at the restaurant and have seen people through the windows inside the President's apartment. Although the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has been discussed for months and probably years, the actual, the quick decision to block the avenue came as a surprise. There was no advance notice to the residents of the district, to commuters and to visitors. The closing of the avenue forced people to seek other routes through the city, caused traffic jams, and, it, and it's wasting people's time. We know the tens of thousands of dollars it cost the city in police time and in routing the traffic patterns. Um, it is not clear to me that the inconvenience and expense caused by the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue significantly increases the safety of the President. I see the closing of the avenue as something comparable to, uh, to building perhaps a medieval moat and filling it with water to protect the Lord. Um, Sure, this measure increases security around the White House, but it's unreasonable. There will always be security concerns around public figures and buildings. However, these are relative. Some concerns are more worrisome than others. 
Again, given the information generally available to the public on the closing of the avenue and knowing that there are other security concerns, it seems to me that the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue was a capricious reaction to the Oklahoma City bombing. I don't, it doesn't seem to me and to the ANC commissioners that the, cl the permanent closing of per Pennsylvania Avenue is warranted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, turn now, if we could, to uh, Millard Say, the Director of Planning for Ramada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is Millard Say. I am the Director of Planning for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak about the impact of the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue on Metrobus service. The closing of Pennsylvania Avenue on May 20th required the rerouting of 10 different Metrobus routes. Scheduled service on these 10 routes consists of 500 weekday trips, 300 Saturday trips, and 225 Sunday trips. Approximately 70,000 weekly riders use this service in the area affected by the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue. As a result, over 150,000 annual bus trips and 3.5 million annual passenger trips will be affected by the rerouting required by the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. The 10 affected routes were changed on May 20th to operate via H Street in place of their previous routing on Pennsylvania Avenue. The routing via H Street is slightly longer than the previous routing via Pennsylvania Avenue, and buses were required to make additional turning movements in order to travel through the affected area. The impact of this new routing in combination with the increase in traffic congestion experienced on H Street has resulted in increased travel time for buses on the 10 adjusted routes. Since the rerouting of the service on May 20th, many of the Metrobus trips operating through the affected area have experienced delays and increased travel times of 5 to 15 minutes during certain parts of the day. Most of the increase in travel time has been experienced on weekdays between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. This increase in travel time has disrupted scheduled services and had an adverse impact on service reliability. In response to the traffic congestion problems that have been experienced in this area since the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, the District of Columbia implemented a new one-way street pattern on June 25th. To accommodate this new street pattern, 10 Metro bus routes that were initially rerouted to H Street on May 20th have now been changed to operate via H and I streets. In addition to these 10 routes, 15 additional Metro bus routes that had been operating on H Street prior to the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue were also rerouted to utilize the new one-way street pattern. These new street changes are expected to reduce the traffic congestion and eliminate the increase in travel time that has been experienced by Metro bus service since the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue. Based on the beneficial impact of this new street pattern, it is that is that this new street pattern is expected to have on current traffic congestion in the area and the continued availability of Madison Place for use by Metro buses, we are hopeful that these changes will eliminate the additional travel time that has been experienced by Metro bus service since the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. This will help minimize the increase in operating costs, the potential reduction in passenger revenue, and any resulting increase in subsidy to the District of Columbia. Now, concerning the cost impact on Metrobus of closing the Pennsylvania Avenue, Metro has incurred to date approximately $40,000 to $50,000 in additional one-time costs in order to implement the two route changes on May 20th and June 25th. This one-time increase in operating costs was for the staff time and resources required to process and implement the route changes, move and relocate bus stops, inform riders, and print new timetables. With regard to the ongoing annual recurring cost of, for the operation of the buses, we believe that the ongoing annual operating cost of the new bus routes will increase by at least $30,000 over the previous annual cost. This assumes, of course, that the new street changes will improve current traffic congestion in the area, that Metro buses operating in the affected area will experience a reduction in current travel time, and that there will be no significant loss in bus ridership due to the rerouting. I want to stress, however, that this projected cost impact is entirely dependent on the results of the new street pattern, which has been in place less than a week and has not really been fully evaluated and analyzed. If the new street pattern does not eliminate the increase in travel time that we've experienced since May 20th, bus schedules will need to be changed to accommodate this increase in travel time. This could have a significant adverse impact on operating costs and bus ridership. 
For example, a continuation of the current increase in travel time of 5 to 15 minutes could generate additional cost of $200,000 annually if it has to be incorporated into the bus schedules on the affected routes. In addition to this potential increase in operating cost, bus ridership is very sensitive to increases in travel time. As a result, any significant increase in running time could have an adverse impact on bus ridership. Given the large number of riders that are passing through the affected area, a small loss in riders could have a significant impact on revenue. For example, a 5% loss in ridership on the affected routes due to increased travel time would result in a $200,000 reduction in annual revenue. Since the new street pattern in the affected area has been in place for less than a week, we are not able to really provide a clear determination on the long-term impact on Metrobus cost, revenue, and subsidy at this time. Once the new one-way street pattern has been in place for a couple of months, new traffic patterns have had a chance to stabilize and traffic enforcement in the area returns to normal levels, we will then be able to determine the long-term impact of the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue on Metrobus service. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared testimony. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Thank you very much. And I turn now to Margaret Jeffers, the Executive Director of the District of Columbia Apartment and Office Building Association. Uh, Margaret, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peggy Jeffers, and I am the Executive Vice President for the Apartment and Office Building Association of Metropolitan Washington. AOBA is a regional trade association representing approximately 90 million square feet of office space, over half of which is located in the District of Columbia, and approximately 155,000 apartment homes, approximately 40,000 of which are located in the District of Columbia. Like Mr. Fazakerly, we have taken this opportunity to solicit feedback from our members on the impact of the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, specifically property owners with uh, buildings along the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor. And while our informal survey was certainly not as extensive as we believe it should be, I will offer the following general comments on the real and or perceived impact from the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue. Our members tell us that as a general rule, city planners and developers would never consider doing something like this if they were at all concerned with maintaining property values and keeping an area attractive to business and international tenants. The closure, as expressed by several people we spoke with, has created two cities. By severing the old central business district from the east end and rest of downtown. By cutting off a major artery, commuters from the west are tremendously disadvantaged if their offices are located in the east end. Anecdotally, many property managers have heard that the commuter hardship created for some is significant, adding up to 30 minutes travel time for some individuals. An employee of a member firm who works on the 1700 block of Pennsylvania Avenue west of the White House and who has to cut across town in peak hours to pick up her spouse who works around the vicinity of Union Station has stated that the closure and resulting traffic congestion initially added up to 45 minutes to her commute. And apparently the, the one-way traffic on I Street now has helped that significantly. Um, however, she's still talking about 20 additional minutes each way during peak hours. For those traveling from Upper Northwest or Maryland to the East End, the added commute time is a major problem. For some, it is not their commute to the office that is affected, but their access to Congress and government agencies that has been seriously impaired by the closure. The building manager at 1701 Pennsylvania Avenue tells us, that, that tells us that it is virtually impossible to get a taxi on that block. The lawyers, consultants, and lobbyists who are often the tenants in our buildings may be motivated, some fear, to relocate. On the other hand, some are concerned about the value of properties east of the White House because of the commuter problems caused by the closure and rerouting of the traffic. In soliciting comments, the only positive response was the speculation that perhaps Pennsylvania Avenue offices with views over the new park that is being planned might enjoy a positive impact. And what we are hearing is that each building is and will be impacted somewhat differently depending on its exact location and its tenants mix, where tenants commute from and what their mobility needs are during the business day. In conclusion, those who we were able to speak with have communicated that it's difficult to quantify the impact of the closure on the economic value of properties, but that it is definitely unwelcome. These same individuals have indicated a willingness to work with this committee to study the impact of the closure, if such a study would be helpful to you and your committee, Mr. Chairman, in your deliberations. Thank you. Peggy, thank you very much. Um, 
Let me sum it up with uh, Ken Huffer. Ken, from the Executive Director of the Washington, D.C. Area Trucking Association. At the conclusion of your comments, I think we are going to probably take a brief recess to go over the floor briefly and vote uh, and then be back. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Ken Hofer, and I am the Executive Director of the Washington, D.C. Area Trucking Association. The D.C. Trucking Association is a trade association serving the motor carrier industry in the District of Columbia and the surrounding jurisdictions. We have approximately 110 members, and the association is the local affiliate of the American Trucking Associations. Ideally, the members of the association would have preferred if Pennsylvania Avenue had not been closed. As I'm sure you are aware, the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has increased the congestion on nearby streets such as 17th, 14th, New York and Rhode Island Avenues. As a result, members of the association, particularly the courier companies, are finding it increasingly difficult to conduct their businesses. For example, much of the street parking that had been available on adjacent streets prior to the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has now been eliminated. This has caused a scramble for the remaining available parking. If the courier companies cannot find parking, many of them are forced to double park in order to deliver their packages. As a result, they incur additional costs in the form of tickets and fines. If the reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue is not an option that we can seriously consider, then the D.C. Trucking Association would ask that the committee consider the following. First, providing additional commercial zone parking zones on, adi on adjacent streets. Second, increasing the time allowed in these parking zones so that companies will have enough time to transact their business. And finally, to design new traffic patterns which impose restrictions such as no left turn in order to keep traffic moving in the area. Environmentally, the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue is likely to reduce the air quality in the district. Trucking companies have been working very hard to reduce emissions by reducing the time that trucks spend on the road. With Pennsylvania Avenue closed, trucks and traffic in general will be spending more time on district streets. More time in traffic means more pollution in D.C. That concludes my comments, and I thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do is just declare a brief recess while we go over to the floor, and then we'll come back and we're going to have questions uh, uh, for all of you at that point. So if there's no objection, I will recess the meeting. We'll adjourn, come back in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. The hearing focuses on the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. More from these proceedings in just a moment. First, some program information. Sunday on C-SPAN, see House Democratic leader Richard Gebhardt's remarks about the role of talk radio in America. He spoke last weekend at the National Association of Radio Talk Show Hosts Convention. See his remarks Sunday evening at 6 Eastern Time, 3 Pacific, here on C-SPAN. Also Sunday night, the latest developments on the road to the White House. This week, California Governor Pete Wilson on the campaign trail in New Hampshire. An interview with Senator Arlen Specter, and a look back at campaign ads from the Reagan-Mondale race of 1984. Road to the White House. Sunday at 7 and 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time, here on C-SPAN, the political network of record. We now return to this hearing on the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, conducted by the House District of Columbia Subcommittee. In May, Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House was permanently closed off to cars and trucks. Chairing the committee, Republican Thomas Davis of Virginia. Are we ready to go? Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry. That's the last vote of the uh, 
for a couple of weeks, though. And the vote was on whether we get a vacation the next week. Or, excuse me, they call, excuse me, they call them, I think, uh, district work periods. Learned the euphemisms of uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, let me start. Uh, Mr. Say, let me ask you a question. Do you know when you might have more specifics on what this could do to the metro system? Well, we, we feel that about three or four weeks after this recent change, we should begin to collect some data and begin to identify some impacts. I think probably sometime in September we'll have a better uh, handle on the long-term impacts. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you'd let us know right away if you could just forward that to the committee. We'd be, I know, very, I'd be very interested on that as a suburban representative who right. recognizes that uh, what happens in the downtown Washington on metro ridership affects what Fairfax and other jurisdictions pay. There really is a ripple effect on those right. things around the region. Peggy, can I ask you a question? Um, what ripple effect, if any, do you anticipate for property values and land use as a result of the actions taken to date? Um, well, like, like I was saying in the testimony, some of the people we talked to said that um, they were concerned about potential diminution of value um, for certain properties, and yet at the same time, they said it's a very difficult thing to quantify. Uh, it, was, it was something they were uh, really reluctant to try to do. What they have said is that um, there's no question that the perception is that there are two cities and how that translates <coughs> into people's uh, decision making is really unclear at this point. But if you're at Riggs Bank, it's going to have an effect, isn't it? Probably. Well, some of them were concerned about investors. Some people were concerned about uh, uh, the effect that it would have on uh, properties specifically located around the White House, those on 15th Street and the Metropolitan Square area. Uh, you know, but again, very difficult to quantify and and uh, reluctant to try to do so. Um, right. And I was in local government for 15 years, and every every land use decision, whether you put a drive in at a bank right. uh, or at a McDonald's or whatever, uh, at least it's perceived in the marketplace and among right. property owners to have uh, <coughs> ramifications on the sales price and value of those Very properties. Definitely. And that you're saying this is not, no, no different in all. In fact, I think you've all cited some specific examples. Uh, Greg, did you want to add to that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that, uh, that I said in my testimony was that uh, so much of the information is anecdotal. I think we have a perfect situa situation that we in the development business never like to see, and that is uncertainty. Uncertainty is the worst of all worlds. And I think what I heard from a lot of the businesses was uncertainty without participation, without participation in what, m what we can do to, to look at more factually what are the real impacts, one, and two, what we do in our business all the time when we look at the impacts and the potential of new development, street closings, doing a development of this size versus that size, we want to analyze the facts as best as we can know them. And then we ask the questions that we all should ask about this. What can we do to mitigate these, uh, these impacts? You know, we've been talking today about the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue, and all of us get focused for the moment on that avenue that runs in front of the White House. But there's a lot of other streets to talk about, not the least of which is that the eastern E Street behind, the, uh, western, excuse me, western uh, E Street behind the White House was a major connector for people getting out of the city in the evening, going from all the office buildings in the east end to, Pennsylvania, Northern, Virginia. to, Northern, Virginia. to Northern Virginia and to Northwest Washington vis-a-vis -vis the Whitehurst Freeway. And so what we need to do is we need to collaborate together, be co-owners, local government and federal mm -hmm. government, do a study quickly, get participation, find out what the facts are, and then get participants like the Secret Service in there and begin to ask the questions. Well, could you live with that being open? Here's how many of the, uh, of the impacts would be mitigated with that one circumstance alone. So I'd like to see this committee move quickly at the end of today to have a sense of that yes, we will have a study, yes, it will be collaborative between the city and the federal government, and we will get, we need to begin to tell the business community that we're not going to just sit back, we're going to get some facts, and we're going to, we're going to close uncertainty and have participation and make it better. Yeah, I don't think, uh, frankly, I don't think that's unreasonable in light of everything at stake. <clears throat> Something nobody mentioned, but I just wondered if anybody has any comments. Uh, do you think taxi fares are going to be affected by this? 
Um, I took a taxi ride over here today, and I just said, what do you think about the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, as I have asked all the cab drivers um, about town. And he started to say it was a terrible, awful, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to a hearing right now. And he said, can I come with you? And I said, <laughs> well, I bet you we and he said, I this have room. lost, this is what he told me, he said, I have lost $40 a day in revenue because he said, you know, we're in the zone system. I don't have, the meter's not ticking for me, and if I have to circumvent the avenue, he said, $40 a day. Well, that was in a study, in an economic impact study, uh, like you talked about, that could be one of the impacts that we uh, could look at. I think we need to have a dialogue. I think that's demonstrated here today by the city officials, and we have one more uh, uh, group, uh, person who's going to testify. But uh, that just make, gives it a softer landing for everybody when we have to make these uh, hard decisions. Um, I've got other questions, but I think I'll, I'll hold them and, and go and pass the baton here to Mrs. Norton, see if she has any questions she'd like to ask. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First, uh, I suppose I should ask this question of um, Ms. Jeffers and Mr. Fernandez. Uh, do you have any notion at the present time of the effect on, on uh, property values? Um, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, any sense of whether uh, you have heard indication from others that it will be harder to rent spaces uh, uh, or apartments in areas that adjoin or are, are affected. Uh, uh, Mr. Fazakerly may also want to uh, answer that question, but I'd like the three of you to look at that issue. Uh, again, um well, there's been some speculation about the East End maybe being adversely affected, office buildings, this is. Uh, there were others, when I raised that question, said, well, it depends. For some uh, who access Capitol Hill, have tenants that do that, it might be advantageous to move from the West End to the East End. Um, I'm it, sorry, I don't understand what you mean. Um, in other words, if the problem for the tenants in your building is a commuter issue, then that impacts potentially uh, the value uh, perception of folks for where they want to be in the city. If the impact is really quantified based on what you do during the day, so for example, if your building is filled with lobbyists and lawyers that want to access this body of Congress and they ha they're on west of the White House, it's makes their accessibility impaired somewhat to be able to get up here. So it really depends. And again, um, those that were speculating as to the effect of this uh, didn't have any studies in front of them, couldn't really give us any statistics. Uh, there, was, there was no evidence really to support saying, making a statement like there's a 5% diminution in value for properties on the East End. So I would be reluctant to say that on the record, um, but I do think that um, it is of concern. Mr. Fernandez? Um, yes, Ms. Norton, thank you. I don't have any data per se, but I can tell you that there is the perception that the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has caused um, additional traffic jams, um, a loss of parking, and that is yet um, another inconvenience on top of many other inconveniences which people go through to uh, live here and also to do business in the city. And simply because there is a, uh, the perception of the lack of parking and the traffic jams, I would say that, yes, it does have an effect on the property values. And on whether or not people decide to live in those adjacent areas? Correct, or rent uh, office space in, uh, in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, the, the two answers that you just received, I think, are ins instructive, that again, what is all the data, and it's the feelings, it's the perceptions, it's the uncertainty. I think one overriding fact that we could subscribe to today is that anything that dislocates or divides the downtown right, can have a dampening effect on the very thing that we're trying to do in the downtown, which is to retain and attract more businesses for the future. And to the extent that we have decisions that have to be made, such as the one we're testifying about today, that we can go about our business in a professional way to quickly assess what the impacts are and then to mitigate those impacts, that's what we really need to do. 
So it's hard for us to give you a clear-cut answer on it. The answer is yes, yes, on one side, yes, and the other side, yes. But the overriding factor is I don't think it's a good feature to start to divide our downtown in terms of dislocation. We need a free flow of commerce in the downtown. And to the extent that this has interrupted this, maybe in a certain level unnecessarily, I think we need to get at the root of it and solve it. Uh, you, you, you said an important word, though. I think it was you, Mr. Bissackley, and you said perception. One of the pro even let's assume what seems unlikely, that there was no effect on travel and on business, and yet, um, like the stock market, <laughs> people react to their perception of what this means, and seeing these huge boulders downtown, knowing good and well that you're certainly not going to be able to get across downtown the same way you, you would if you uh, if your address is 1750 Pennsylvania Avenue or some such, or even uh, the adjoining residential community, uh, and you have choices, uh, one wonders if uh, you are drawn like a magnet to uh, the choice you might have made before Pennsylvania Avenue was closed. Now, to, in order to change perceptions that may be harmful, leave aside actual injury, it takes very proactive action, something that is larger than life to say, no, there, we are making room and time and effort for you, so this is, this is not as bad as it seems. So one of the things we'll be searching for are ways in which to make that happen. Uh, the east side is a critical part of downtown. And it, you, you, you could not be more right. I don't know of a single downtown in the United States that is divided. There, there may be some, but I just don't know of any. The one part of town that is a composite whole is downtown. The rest of, uh, of, the, of the city may be divided in, in different ways. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an important issue. Let me ask about um, Mr. Reuter uh, and Mr. H uh, Hofer. I, I want to ask about um, vehicular traffic. Uh, Mr. Rorty, you have some one-time cost, forty to fifty thousand dollars, and then you th you you speak about how there could be a loss of ridership, and that makes us all tremble in, in, in this uh, moment in Metro's history, uh, which could be up to two hundred thousand uh, do uh, dollars. I guess you're speaking. You talk about ongoing costs of $30,000. Now, first let me ask you about the one-time costs. Have these been reimbursed or are they being reimbursed uh, as they are incurred? Well, we believe that the District of Columbia is seeking reimbursement, but we have had no indication from anyone that it will be reimbursed to us directly. Uh, do you know that among the issues that the Highway Department said they would reimburse <clears throat> Uh, is the forty to fifty thousand one time cost to Metro? Has that been does that come out of their mouth? I have heard the district talk about that, but I have not heard it from them directly. We will we will ascertain that specifically then because this is obviously a one time cost. Let me move on to the thirty thousand dollars of apparent ongoing costs and ask you to give me examples of what kind of ongoing costs would be involved. Okay, well, one of the ongoing costs is the fact that even if the traffic congestion problem does not result in an increase in travel time, the route as they currently operate today are longer than they were when they operated via Pennsylvania Avenue. Now, under our allocation formula, which we charge jurisdictions for bus service, the, one of the components of that is a mileage charge. And so jurisdictions get charged a certain amount of cost based upon the number of miles that buses operate. So in this, in this particular case, since the routes are longer and they are going to drive more miles, there would be an increase in cost to the district as a result. I see. And this is a cost to the district alone because of mileage that, has, that, that is incurred for federal purposes. Yeah, the ongoing cost would be a charge to the district, right. Um, you talk about the pattern, uh, you, you, you say you're not sure of, uh, 
of, of what the pattern of inconvenience is because of, of street pattern changes that are only a week old. I take it you're referring to the one-way streets? Right, that's correct. And you believe that the one-way streets will significantly help metro buses in particular? Based on our discussions with the district staff, we think that it will eliminate a lot of the problem that we've experienced since May 20th, but I think it would be very premature to say that it is going to eliminate the problem. I think we really don't know that until we've seen it. As you heard before, there's a lot higher level of enforcement, traffic enforcement in the area right now. We don't know what the long-term traffic enforcement will be, and we don't know what the impact of pulling that enforcement out will be. So I don't really think until August or September, when things have had a chance to settle down and get into a more of a routine, will we really be able to see the impact from a long-term standpoint. Um, what, if any, effect has the presence of um, these detailed uh, police had on Metro buses in particular? And then I'd have to ask Mr. Hofer, if he's seen any effect of the, um, of the police who have been apparently temporarily placed around the area? Well, I think certainly it's a beneficial impact. I think, uh, as you noted earlier, it, with regard to the impact that they have on rush hour traffic in this area, I think they have helped. And I'm concerned that when they are pulled out, that it could have an adverse impact. Uh, Mr. Hoffa? Yes, I would um, agree with that statement. Um, one of the, the problems mentioned to me by some of my courier members is the fact that um, before, or I should say, with uh, having removed some of the parking zones that were there before the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue, um, it's taken away some of the loading zones and thereby it causes some of the, the other traffic maybe to to um, loading zones as well as parking zones, and it may cause some, cause some of the um, commuter traffic to, to some of the commuter traffic to, I guess, occupy some of the space that w had been prior or before the closing left for commercial parking. And now that parking is no longer, or that space is no longer or available, it makes it more difficult for the drivers to get in and out to deliver their packages. Mm -hmm. And with the, tr the, the presence of the, the police there as it stands now, a lot of the, the couriers feel that it keeps the traffic moving. Mm -hmm. And without police presence there, their, their fear is that that traffic may stall and that will make it even more difficult for them to make their deliveries. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't see how it can be argued there should be preferential treatment for the Capitol complex when it comes to cops stationed out there to direct traffic, particularly since there's been no closings uh, in, in the main arteries of the Capitol complex and still we have these cops making sure that everybody keeps going. There has been a closing here that affects business residents, commuters, I don't see how this is going to be viable if those cops leave, and I can tell you who can't pay for them. Guess. Uh, Ms. Jeffers, you indicated uh, that, that, uh, 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 that any benefit might come from some park that <clears throat> might uh, emerge. Well, uh, they're going to have to come by me to, to, to come up with something that improves upon Lafayette Park and tear up Pennsylvania Avenue. So I'm not sure that people are going to get I that. As I said, bit. it was, it was uh, <laughs> know. you know, just a bone that was thrown out as one possible yeah. positive. That was if, in the overwhelming response was this is not welcome. It's created two cities. It's a major disconnect. Um, and that was just a stretch mm -hmm. for what positive anything could happen. It would benefit very few. <coughs> yeah. It... it, it uh, it, it, it's the kind of stretch that indicates that there, there may not be a lot of benefit, but I think it's, it's only fair to ask, do you see any benefit that either are coming or could come from the closing of a, a main artery uh, and its conversion into uh, a pedestrian uh, mall? Do any of you see any, any, any benefit that could come or is coming from that? I, I hear silence. I know the sound of silence when I hear it. Uh, I, I am a, uh, a registered environmentalist and like the idea of malls, if you consider this mall, uh, it, 
uh, has the exact opposite effect from what pedestrian malls are supposed to do because uh, it creates huge amounts of extra pollution on other streets while removing obviously some pollution from a very wide street so that any benefit, any environmental benefit that might otherwise obtain I think is simply not here now. I want to thank you all for what for testimony that I have found personally very useful. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much and let me thank this panel. I think you've gotten some revealing testimony and some good ideas as we move forward. We look forward to a continued dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to call our final witness, uh, Mr. Robert Gresham, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the National Capital Planning Commission. Uh, Mr. Gresham will be testifying in lieu of the Executive Director, Reginald uh, Griffith. And uh, Mr. Gresham, if you could stand up. As you've heard, it's the policy of the committee to swear in witnesses. And if you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. Yes, sir. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, let me add that any written statement uh, will be made a part of our record, and please proceed uh, with uh, your oral statement. If you can keep it within five minutes, uh, we'd appreciate it. But yes, sir, you're up Mr. here Chairman. alone, so. Uh, since you do have uh, my written statement, if yeah. it's okay, I will just uh, summarize by hitting a few, a few highlights uh, of that. Um, just for the record, again, my name is Robert Gresham, uh, Deputy Executive Director of the National Capital Planning Commission, uh, filling in for uh, our Executive Director, Mr. Griffith, who is out of town. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, present an explanation of the uh, statutory procedures for closing streets uh, in the district and the role of our Commission uh, in that process. Um, as noted by a number of witnesses in uh, the first panel uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, Congress has delegated to the District of Columbia uh, government the authority to close streets within the district. Uh, under D.C. law, before the council may consider a street closing, the mayor must, among a number of other things, uh, refer the, cap uh, the application to the Planning Commission for its recommendations. Uh, as uh, several other witnesses have uh, already noted, uh, a statutory street closing refers to an action which transfers title uh, to the property under the right-of-way from the public domain into public or private ownership to be used for other than access purposes for pedestrians uh, and or vehicles. Uh, in such instances, the determination of the ultimate ownership of the former right-of-way vest or rest with the uh, D.C. Council. Uh, if the procedures outlined above do not occur, uh, there is no street closing in the uh, statutory sense. And as others have already pointed out this afternoon, under this definition, uh, the relevant streets in the vicinity of the White House as of this date have not been closed. Uh, they have been restricted to vehicular traffic. Uh, the task of preparing both an interim and long-term design for Pennsylvania Avenue uh, has been given uh, by the White House, by the Chief of Staff, uh, to the uh, Secretary of Interior. Uh, our commission is one of 12 agencies that are involved uh, in the ultimate design for this area. Uh, the national, and in that connection, uh, the National Capital Planning Act requires that all federal and district agencies consult with the Planning Commission uh, prior to and at all stages during the development of plans uh, for proposed developments uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, therefore, whether or not uh, the avenue is closed according to statute, uh, if the area encompassing Pennsylvania Avenue uh, uh, between 15th and 17th, as well as the other uh, streets that have been referred to uh, in the vicinity of the White House, uh, if this area is redesigned, uh, such development would require formal consultation with this commission uh, as provided uh, in the Planning Act. Um, that uh, concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions uh, of the uh, subcommittee. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me ask a question from your perspective. If the Secret Service has the authority to restrict access to Pennsylvania Avenue, do they have the authority to keep those restrictions in place as long as necessary? 
Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure, I'm not a legal authority, uh, but uh, I, I believe it's our sense uh, from uh, uh, our understanding of authorities that have been cited by uh, the Department of the Treasury and concurred in by the Department of Justice that they believe uh, that is the case, but I think it would probably be best to, uh, uh, to maybe confirm that with those. Well, uh, I think agencies. that that squares with what you're saying. I just wanted to, yeah. and, and I, I appreciate your, your caveat. Let me ask you this, but if the street is to be legally and permanently closed uh, and something else done with the land, do you think they'd have to follow the statutory procedure that exists for that purpose in those cases? Um, I, I really believe, at least based on uh, other precedents that we have seen... Don't worry, I mean, you're under, a, but I'm not holding you to any legal requirement that it be... Uh, you have the I's dotted and T's crossed and precedents right. in place legal. I'm just asking for a gut reaction. Yes, sir. Well, based on my experience from, from, from several years with the Commission, uh, we've actually seen improvements take place uh, in street rights of way, uh, or former street rights of way, uh, as a case may be, uh, under both circumstances, either in cases where there have been statutory street closings, uh, and in some cases where there have not been statutory street closings, but where uh, the uh, streets have been closed to vehicular traffic and uh, uh, permanent uh, pedestrian improvements have been installed within uh, those rights of way. Okay. Do you know of any precedent for what was happening in this case? Any other precedents or streets that have been closed in this, or, or, or I don't say closed, have uh, vehicular access uh, denied uh, similar to this? Yes, sir. In, in fact, uh, there are some cases uh, where the restriction has taken place and subsequent to that, improvements have actually uh, uh, been, in, uh, been put in place. A couple of the, the, camp the, the examples that uh, uh, come most quickly to mind uh, involve one in the vicinity of the White House, East Executive Drive, uh, between the White House, the North-South Street between the White House and the Department of Treasury building. Mm -hmm. Uh, was uh, restricted to vehicular traffic back, I believe it was in uh, 1983. And uh, that uh, uh, action was followed up by the preparation of a uh, design landscape development plan uh, that was then reviewed through uh, the public agency's process uh, and, of course, was implemented and is now in place. I, I actually worked at the White House in 1970 and 71, and I remember when it was open, and you could be dropped off right. there and you could walk through, and the tours started uh, back there. So right. I, 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 now, that, that, I understand, was done without a closing. There are uh, a few examples uh, in the more traditional, the older downtown part of Washington, uh, a one-block section of G Street in front of the Martin Luther King Library, uh, two blocks of F Street in front of the old Patent Office building, which is now the National Portrait Gallery, and an intersecting one-block section of uh, 8th Street. Uh, these streets were, uh, uh, again, restricted to vehicular traffic back in the 1970s. I believe it was the early 70s, before 75. And... Uh, uh, pedestrian improvements were, uh, were installed uh, in those streets uh, as uh, pedestrian ways. It was part of a program that was called a Streets for People program uh, at the time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that, that's good, that's good, that's good knowledge. I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Norton, I recognize my ranking member. Yeah. You're on. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gresham. Yes, ma'am. Do you know of any, you, 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 you cite streets that have been closed, do you know of any artery in the District of Columbia as major as Pennsylvania Avenue that has ever been closed down and incurred improvements as a result of its being closed down? I, the, the examples that I cited, Ms. Norton, I don't believe carried the level of traffic that, uh, that the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue section in, the white, in front of the White House carried. Thank you. Are you aware of, uh, what's your view of what uh, um, was done, I believe it was in the 1960s, on F Street? The... Um, 
the improvements, uh, the streets for people improvements, if, uh, if they're the improved, they're actually the divided, were, the divided, were uh, oh, there were two different developments in F Street. One was the median that was placed yeah, in, uh, that's the one. Uh, I think, two or three blocks of F Street, I believe from 12th to 14th. Uh, that actually occurred before I began to work with the Planning Commission, although just a few years before. Uh, and uh, uh, I was, uh, was not involved in that. I was uh, with the Commission when the uh, Streets for People improvements took place uh, a little further east uh, on F Street. Um, I think uh, the... Um, uh, if you're talking about a personal opinion, I am. Uh, the uh, uh, the recent restoration of uh, of that street has, uh, uh, I think, been uh, uh, been done very attractively, and I think the uh, median uh, was somewhat uh, ill maintained uh, and uh, uh, over the years and uh, did become a problem uh, uh, in in that particular section of F Street. And of course it became a major traffic problem in F Street. It did, it, and on a cost benefit analysis, I know of, I know of nobody with uh, uh, an interest either in the aesthetics or in the traffic effect who regarded that as a uh, advance. It had something to do with the hubris of believing that uh, uh, we could improve upon the <laughs> original plans, the L'Enfant plan. And I'm wondering whether we continue with such hubris. Do you believe that we can improve upon the Lafayette Park uh, environment in front, of the, in front of the White House? Well, I believe, uh, again, it's... Uh, uh, Ms. Norton, if you'll bear with me for just a moment. Of course, I'm a... Uh, a staff person who uh, is here on behalf of a 12-member uh, commission, and the commission, of course, uh, sets policy and would ultimately uh, uh, make a decision uh, based upon a proposal uh, put before it as to whether or not they felt an improvement proposal uh, for that section of Pennsylvania Avenue did have the potential uh, for uh, uh, improving it. So. Strictly speaking for myself as a planner not representing uh, in any way uh, that larger view of the commission, uh, I think there is potential from a design uh, and uh, uh, open space continuity standpoint for uh, uh, some improvement uh, in that area. I, uh, Would you elaborate on what kind of improvement you have in mind? When you say that? Well, I don't, I, I, I was really speaking just with respect to uh, the question of potential. Uh, my own sense is that the uh, uh, condition that's already been created has uh, to some extent uh, uh, really facilitated the interaction of pedestrian movement uh, in that area between the sidewalk in front of the White House. So why would House anything, anybody need anything else? It's a wide avenue that you can interact with everybody out there. Why would anybody consider tearing up Pennsylvania Avenue or f futzing around with uh, Lafayette Park uh, on the theory that, that a further improvement could be made? Well, I think that that's... Uh, uh, I, th I think you would find designers and planners who would uh, love to get uh, a hold of it. Who would feel <laughs> that there is a great opportunity. I think you would probably find uh, preservationists and other planners and designers who would feel that the uh, retention of the cartway, uh, because it does represent some historic value, uh, should be retained. And there's uh, also my understanding as a school of thought that. Uh, uh, some design and landscape improvements uh, could probably be achieved uh, that would uh, perhaps achieve the, both, the best of both of those uh, approaches by still retaining some semblance of uh, the cartway but uh, also making the area more pedestrian friendly than it was when it was strictly uh, a street car cartway. But again, please, it's all, please, it's, it, yeah, I, I understand. please understand, these I, are really... I understand uh, the position you're, you're being put in. Yeah. I tell you, it's awfully p pedestrian friendly now because a pedestrian doesn't encounter anything but a wide open space. Um, 
the commission is known for, for being a guardian of, of, uh, of the uh, history of, and particularly architectural and landscape history of Washington, especially when D.C. wants to do something. We, we like uh, and I certainly it. hope it won't lose its mind because who happens to be involved now is, is the White House or a federal entity uh, because we, we intend to hold a commission to the self-same standards and I intend, I tell you here right now, that any changes that are going to go on are going to have to come through the Congress and are not going to come out of, uh, uh, are not going to come out of uh, the commission or anybody else. It's going to have to be authorized. Uh, it, and and uh, I have assurances that, and you can carry this back to the commission, that um, um, actions such as national <laughs> national contests to see who can do what best are inappropriate until this matter is thoroughly uh, understood and its effects uh, are thoroughly felt. Uh, we believe that uh, this area deserves the same kind of protection that uh, uh, the Commission has believed that uh, should obtain in other circumstances. Uh, the notion of a rush to change uh, by uh, those who uh, uh, will have a very hard time <laughs> coming up to the standards that the Commission has usually uh, established. It's just not going to happen. Um, let me just ask uh, uh, your view on one other matter. If Pennsylvania Avenue were uh, a piece of private property, uh, I'm sorry, a piece of public property, and there was a uh, big apartment, uh, a big department store uh, that had the idea that you could make uh, a wonderful plaza there if you simply closed the street and got permission to do so. Uh, I take it that you would agree that uh, that action would be subject uh, to the District of Columbia street closing and alley closing procedures? Yes, ma'am. And the only reason it may not, and that is still an open legal question, is because the street, though under the, quote, jurisdiction of the district, uh, was closed by federal authorities. Um, this matter may not, may or may not fall under the district's street and alley closing authority, but I can tell you this much, it's a taking as far as the district is concerned on either side. It, it, it is impossible to believe that you ha if you have an apartment building on either side that you can rent for what you could rent the day before the closing. It's impossible to believe that people who have deliveries made uh, have property values that are unaffected. We won't know the real answer to that for some years to come. But that is why, uh, as far as most of us are concerned, this is not the time to leap forward with um, plans for change. The dust has hardly settled on Pennsylvania Avenue. The testimony that has come before us is if you take those cops away, the whole thing gets, the whole of downtown gets strangled. So th is it, this has been a most unsettling um, occurrence coming in the midst of uh, the district's virtual insolvency. Uh, most who come before us today have not questioned uh, the need what, what we have questioned is the lack of give and take on how to proceed following the closing. So as far as this member is concerned, um, the closing is a temporary, indeed even the Secret Service calls it a restriction, and until it, it'll be some time, I can assure you, before uh, the NCPC is going to have much to do about this. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ms. Norton, thank you, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gresham, for being with you and sharing uh, your very extensive knowledge of the history of this and other uh, closings. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to enter into the record a written statement uh, submitted by the District of Columbia Chamber of Commerce and by the American Automobile Association in a consultant's report and follow-up statement sent to the subcommittee by Mr. Uh, Robert Morris, who advised the Treasury Department on this matter. The subcommittee will continue to work with the district and the administration on these uh, uh, on this issue and intend to have a subsequent hearing on this matter. At this point, I'd also ask unanimous consent.